The House will come to order. <laughs> Prayer by the chaplain. Thank you for allowing me the chance to pray with you today. God, our Father, we invite you to be present with us wherever we are, that we might learn from you how to love your people and direct them to what is truly good. May you raise up in these your sons and daughters who have been given the awesome privilege of holding public office through the sacred trust of the people, the heroic virtues necessary for selfless lives of public service. May they seek the common good with a posture of humility before you and one another and permit them to accomplish more together than they could ever do on their own. Enlighten their understanding and open them to your inspiration. May they lay their strengths, weaknesses, and even their disagreements before you for the cause of establishing right order and justice among the people of this state. May all bitterness, evil, and division be cast far away and anoint them with the spirit of charity and understanding so that goodwill, righteousness, and peace animate their deliberations. Give them courage for the mission of upholding human dignity and true freedom. And in the end, may they govern the kingdom on this part of the earth in the manner that reflects the providence of your design so that it prepares your people for your eternal kingdom in heaven. Amen. God bless you. The chaplain for today is Very Reverend Jonathan Kelly from St. John Vianney College Seminary, St. Paul, Minnesota. Hope I'm saying that right. Pledge of Allegiance. Please remain standing and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will call the roll.
Will the chief clerk please call the names of the members who have not answered the quorum call yet? Members, please take your conversations off of the House floor so that we can hear the quorum call. <clears throat> Albright. Albright. Albright present. Backer. Backer present. Backer present. Daphne. Daphne Grunhagen present Grunhagen present Hamilton Hamilton present Hamilton present Hassan Hassan present Hassan present Hausman Hausman present Hausman present Heinrich Heinrich present Kiel Keel, present. McDonald. McDonald, present. McDonald, present. Moran. Moran. Munson. Munson. Munson, present. Munson, present. Pearson. Pearson, Sandell, present. Pearson, present. Sandell, present. Sandell, present. Tice, Tice, present. Thompson, Thompson, present. <clears throat> Thompson, present. West. West present. Daphne. Daphne. Moran. Moran. Pearson. Pearson. Pearson present. The clerk will close the roll. A quorum is present. The clerk will read the journal of the preceding day. Journal of the House, 92nd Session, 2022, St. Paul, Minnesota, Monday, February 28th, 2022. If there is no objection, further reading of the journal will be dispensed with and the journal will be approved as corrected by the chief clerk. Hearing no objection, the journal is approved as corrected by the chief clerk. Reports of standing committees and divisions. A copy of this order of business is online. We will take action on all committee reports with the exception of the five reports relating to appointments to the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. If there is no objection, the reports will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the reports are adopted. Information on the candidates and their backgrounds has been emailed, titled Handout, Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board Appointments to all members, and that information is also available at the House desk. Nelson M. from the Committee on State Government Finance and Elections, to which was referred Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board, George Soule, reported the same back with a recommendation that the appointment be confirmed. Nelson M. moves that the report of the Committee on State Government Finance and Elections relating to the appointment of George Soule to the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board be now adopted. The member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and that is my motion. 
Member, there, members, there are two votes on each of these. The first vote <clears throat> is on the uh, motion to adopt the report. The second motion is on the confirmation itself. On Representative Nelson's motion to adopt the report, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, aye. please say no. The motion prevails. Confirmation. Nelson M. moves that the House, having advised, do now consent to, to confirm the appointment of George Sowell, effective March 30th, 2021, for a term that expires on January 6, 2025. Representative Nelson. Madam Speaker, that is my motion. All those in favor of the motion to confirm, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, aye. please say no. The motion prevails. <clears throat> Nelson M. from the Committee on State Government Finance and Elections, to which was referred Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board, Margaret Lepic, reported the same back with a recommendation that the appointment be confirmed. Nelson M. moves that the report of the Committee on State Government Finance and Elections relating to the appointment of Margaret Lepic to the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board be now adopted. Representative Nelson. Madam Speaker, that is my motion. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The report is adopted. Confirmation. Nelson M. moves that the House, having advised, do now consent to confirm the appointment of Margaret Lepic, effective July 19th, 2021, for a term that expires on January 1st, 2024. Representative Nelson. Madam Speaker, members, that is my motion. All those in favor of the motion to confirm Commissioner Lepic, please say aye. 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 And those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. Nelson M. from the Committee on State Government Finance and Elections, to which was referred Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board, Ferris Rashid, reported the same back with a recommendation that the appointment be confirmed. Nelson M. moves that the report of the Committee on State Government Finance and Elections relating to the appointment of Ferris Rashid to the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board be now adopted. Representative Nelson. Madam Chair, or Madam Speaker, and members, that is my motion. All those in favor of the motion to adopt the report related to Ferris Rashid, please say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed, aye. please say no. The motion prevails. The report is adopted. Confirmation. Nelson M. moves that the House, having advised, do now consent to and confirm the appointment of Ferris Rashid, effective July 19th, 2021 for a term that expires on January 2nd, 2023. Representative Nelson. Madam Speaker, members, that is my motion. All those in favor of the motion to confirm Ferris Rashid, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, aye. please say no. The motion prevails. Nelson M. from the Committee on State Government Finance and Elections, to which was referred Person? Campaign Finance and Public aye. Disclosure Board, Stephen Swanson reported the same back with a recommendation that the appointment be confirmed. Nelson M. moves that the report of the Committee on State Government Finance and Elections relating to the appointment of Stephen Swanson to the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board be now adopted. Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Again, that is my motion. On the motion to adopt the report relating to Stephen Swanson, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. <clears throat> Nelson M. from the Committee on State Government Finance and Elections, to which was referred Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board, David Asp, reported the same back with a recommendation that the appointment be confirmed. Nelson M. moves that the report of the Committee on State Government Finance and Elections relating to the appointment of David Asp to the Committee on Finance and Public Disclosure Board be now adopted. Yep. Did we do both the report and the confirmation on
confirmation. Nelson M. moves that the House, having advised, do now consent to and confirm the appointment of Stephen Swanson, effective July 19, 2021, for a term that expires on January 1, 2024. Representative Nelson. I thought we had, we were jumping here, but yes, that, Madam Speaker and members, that is my motion. On the motion to confirm Stephen Swanson, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed, aye. please say no. The motion prevails. <clears throat> Nelson M. from the Committee on State Government Finance and Elections, to which was referred Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board, David Asp, reported the same back with a recommendation that the appointment be confirmed. Nelson M. moves that the report of the Committee on State Government Finance and Elections relating to the appointment of David Asp to the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board be now adopted. Representative Nelson. Madam Speaker and members, again, that is my motion. On the motion to adopt the report relating to David Asp, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, aye. please say no. The motion prevails. Conf confirmation, Nelson M. moves that the House, having advised, do now consent to and confirm the appointment of David Asp, effective February 16, 2022, for a term that expires on January 5, 2026. On the motion to confirm, David Asp, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, aye. please say no. The motion prevails. Second reading of House Files. Second reading, House File number 1815. Second reading. Second reading, House File 2433. Second reading. Second reading, House File 2671. Second reading. Second reading, House File 2746. Second reading. Second reading, House File 2993. Second reading. Second reading, House File 3249. Second reading. Second reading, House File 3251. Second reading. Second reading, House File 3346. Second reading. Second reading, House File 3454. Second reading. Introduction and first reading of House Files. The following House Files have been offered for introduction today. The Chief Clerk will report the House Files and give them their first reading. Introduction of first reading of House Files 3874 through 4012. First reading, House Files 3874 through 4012. <clears throat> Messages from the Senate. Message from the Senate, Madam Speaker. I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following Senate files herewith transmitted. Senate file numbers 2575 and 2729. The message is signed Cal R. Ludeman, Secretary of the Senate. First reading of Senate files. First reading of Senate file number 2575, an act relating to education. The bill is being referred to the Committee on Education Policy. First reading, Senate file number 2729, an act relating to education. The bill is being referred to the Committee on Education Policy. Report from the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. Winkler from the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration, pursuant to Rules 1.21 and 3.33, designates the following bills to be placed on the calendar for the day for Thursday, March 3rd, 2022, and establishes a pre-filing requirement for amendments offered to the following bills. House file numbers 2875, 3175, and 3035. Calendar for the day. The first bill on the calendar for the day is House File 2875. <clears throat> House File number 2875, number one on the calendar for the day, an act relating to energy, the second engrossment. There are no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File number 2875. Third reading. I recognize the author of the bill, the member from Hennepin, Representative Long, to the bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So this bill is just to fix a couple of uh, technical issues with a project that we passed last session, the Prairie Island Net Zero Project. It is a really exciting and innovative opportunity for the Prairie Island Indian community to demonstrate a net zero community in our state. It had bipartisan support when it passed. Um, the two things that this bill is updating, the first is that they had a deadline of the first of this year to have the 
um, the contract uh, all signed. But with COVID, as with many things, there has been a lot of delays in terms of being able to uh, get all the contracting done. And this is a big, complicated project. So we are going to push that deadline out one year. And then the other thing this does is that uh, the appropriation uh, language before uh, we, we heard from our fiscal staff needed some tweaks and updating. Uh, so it would be fixing uh, those updates um, and uh, making sure that we also have in here um, an end date for the appropriation of 2031, which we did not have in the original bill. Uh, and that, those are the, uh, the provisions of the bill, and I ask for member support. The member from Wright, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Long. I was actually going to ask you that question about the cancel back. So uh, just so if everyone didn't hear that, the cancel back is now 2031. But in fairness, we didn't have a cancel back before. So it was $30.2 million coming out of the RDA, which is not general fund, but it's a special revenue fund that comes from the taxpayers and, well, I should say the ratepayers of Excel Energy on the cask fees. I'm in Monticello, and uh, Representative Haley is in the Prairie Island community, which um, she's also in the room. So anyway, there was not a cancel back date, and I, I appreciate, Representative Long, that you actually added a cancel back date, even though it's all the way out in 2031, which is an awful long time. Um, may I suggest, I won't ask you to yield, but may I suggest that that would be maybe another tweak at some point, that you would maybe make that a little bit shorter than 2031. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Goodhue, Representative Haley. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Long, uh, for moving this bill along. Uh, you did a good job of explaining the technical corrections that we needed to make. And thank you, Representative O'Neill, um, for clarifying the issue on that date. Um, you know, one of those things that that helps with is because of COVID and supply chain issues uh, that the community isn't able to procure everything needed for the project at the time and costs, as you all know, um, across all these industries are very high right now. So that will give us an opportunity to be more efficient um, with these taxpayer dollars as they work on this project. And I also wanted to point out the project um, uh, is very exciting for the Prairie Island Indian community, but also for the state because this is truly a pilot project that the state of Minnesota will be able to demonstrate what it means to be a net zero community. And it doesn't just impact the tribal uh, community right at uh, Prairie Island there uh, and where the power plant, uh, but other parts of their community where they own businesses and have uh, residents of their community living. So we will all benefit from the knowledge that is gained from this project uh, for the entire state of Minnesota. Thank you again, Representative Long, and I appreciate a yes vote this afternoon. Any further discussion to the bill? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Members, please vote. Will the clerk please call the names of the members who have not voted yet? Backer. Backer votes aye. Backer aye. Grunhagen. Grunhagen aye. Grunhagen aye. Hamilton. Hamilton aye. Hamilton aye. Hassan. Hassan aye. Hassan aye. Houseman. Houseman aye. Houseman aye. McDonald. McDonald aye. McDonald aye. Moran. Moran. Munson. Munson, I. Munson, I. Novotny. Novotny, I. Swazinski. Swazinski, I. Thompson. Thompson, I. Thompson, I. West. West. West, I.
Um, yeah, yep. Novotny. Novotny says aye. Yep. He voted though. He just didn't get on the board, I guess. Moran. The clerk will close the roll. There being 132 ayes and one nay, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 3175. The clerk will report the bill. House file number 3175, number two on the calendar for the day, an act relating to local government. There's an amendment. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Bolden moves to amend House file number 3175. The amendment is coded A22-0324. The member from Olmsted, Representative Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. That is my amendment. It uh, just removes six uh, additional words that are duplication from the actual bill. So just a cleanup amendment. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those aye. opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House Hall number 3175, as amended. Third reading, as amended. Representative Bolden. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. House File 3175 is a cleanup bill. It repeals redundancies in zoning and planning laws for Minnesota townships. What we currently have are two sets of powers that developed independently over time, and one of them has become the exclusive means by which townships conduct their land use planning. One set of powers is contained in Chapter 366 and is specific to townships. House File 3175 would repeal those sections of Chapter 366 that contain the original land use powers for townships. The powers outlined under that chapter were first granted back in the 1930s. Some towns still have their ordinances based on that chapter, but they aren't actively using them. For any town where this may be the case, there is a redirect to the second set of powers, which will provide continuity of land use management after the repeal would take effect. The second set of powers are outlined in Chapter 462 and, this are, and are the same powers, which are granted to townships under Chapter 366. Townships have been able to use Chapter 462 since 1982. And in that time, they have shown their clear preference for using Chapter 462 when conducting new land use planning. At the desk, there's a letter from the Minnesota Association of Townships. In that letter is a chart which identifies where each power granted under Chapter 366 can be found under Chapter 462, so we can be sure that townships are not losing any authorities with the repeal. So in conclusion, uh, House File 3175 will reduce redundancies and confusion for townships, landowners, and developers. Thank you for your consideration. I ask for your support and a green vote, members. Thank you. Any discussion to the bill? Seeing no discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Members, please vote. Will the clerk please call the names of the members who have not yet voted? Backer. Backer, aye. Backer, aye. Barr. Barr, aye. Bierman. Aye. 
Biermann, I. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, I. Grunhagen, I. Hamilton. Hamilton, I. Hamilton, I. Hassan. Hassan, I. Hassan, I. Hausman. Hausman, I. Hausman, I. Mariani. Mariani. McDonald. McDonald, I. McDonald, I. Moran. Moran. Munson. Munson, I. Munson, I. Thompson. Thompson, I. Thompson, I. Mariani. Mariani. Moran. Moran, I. Moran, I. The clerk will close the roll. There being 133 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 3035. The clerk will report the bill. House File number 3035, number three on the calendar for the day, an act relating to transit, the first engrossment. I recognize the member from Hennepin, the author of the bill, Representative Hornstein, to explain the bill. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Speaker and members. House File 3035 is a bill to require an audit of the Southwest Light Rail Project, also known as the Green Line Extension. This is a light rail project that goes from downtown Minneapolis to Eden Prairie. The origins of this bill, members, are that uh, over the summer in late July, a cost overrun of $200 million was reported. Uh, at that time, uh, myself and Senator Dibble grew very concerned about a, not only the size of that particular cost overrun, but a pattern of increased cost uh, and delay to this project. So at that time, we contacted the Office of the Legislative Auditor. We felt the situation had become serious enough that this really merited what's called a special review. Now, the Office of Legislative Auditor does two kinds of uh, work products. One is a special review that can be requested uh, by members and, and others uh, in the public, uh, and the other is a program evaluation. That's the one where we're pretty familiar with, the yellow sheet. We rank uh, our uh, choices, choices are uh, uh, put forward and we rank them, and then the Audit Commission uh, makes a decision on those priorities. We felt this was important and urgent enough uh, to request a special review over the summer. And so the uh, OLA responded and said that they didn't necessarily have the resources to do a full-on special review, but they would actually take a look at this because they agreed with us that this was urgent and it was important to get at the reasons why we have these cost overruns and delays. So a very extensive memo was uh, issued on October 28th. Uh, members of the Audit Commission, myself, Senator Newman, Senator Dibble were the recipients of this. Um, it's, of course, public information. You can take a look at it. There were enough alarms and red flags in this document, dated October 28th of this year, that uh, we felt it would be very, very important to do something a little out of the ordinary, which is to actually do a bill uh, to, aud to do a full audit of this project, a program evaluation, as well as continuing this special review. And so uh, myself and Senator Dibble introduced this bill uh, very early in the session. We've had bipartisan uh, sponsorship. Uh, Senator Newman, Representative Petersburg. So you have the four uh, leaders of transportation in each body and each party uh, signing on to this bill. And I've been very happy with the bipartisan support we've received through the committee process. So members, if you look at the, the legislation, you'll see that we have 17 very specific items that we want the legislative auditor to investigate. It is very thorough, and again, this is a bit unusual, but I think the situation here 
is without precedent as well. And we have checked off on this process, not only uh, with the legislative auditor who has given us input uh, to the bill, but also the leaders of the Audit Commission, uh, Representative Hansen and Senator Coran. And so, members, uh, I ask for your support. Uh, this is an urgent matter. This ma merits a special review and a program evaluation uh, because of the, the, the nature of the, of the overruns. Finally, in addition to what we had learned over the summer, we learned very recently within the last uh, month or so that there were some additional cost overruns and delays. Uh, now the project is uh, slated to be completed in 2027. So what this audit does is gets at all of the issues, whether it is um, uh, change orders. We understand that there have been issues with change orders, uh, contractors, um, the whole thing. We have cost-benefit analysis. We have safety issues. All will be examined. Take a look at these 17 very specific directives. Again, we wouldn't be able to do this under a, a typical legislative audit process, but the bill affords us this opportunity. So members, we can come together on this. This is about transparency. This is about accountability. We need to get to the bottom of what's causing this. I ask for your support, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions to the bill before we take up the amendments. Uh, the member from Isante, the minority leader, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I know that's really unconventional, um, but I, I just wanted to get a little more clarification on this, and I apologize. I can't see in the bill um, and I didn't catch it in your comments, uh, Representative Hornstein, when these uh, reports will be, when these audits or special reviews will be done. Um, and I think that's important. We, we turn into pumpkins, of course, uh, the, the first Saturday, or excuse me, the first Monday after the third Saturday in May, according to the Constitution. Um, and I think the legislature would like to take action on, on the results of this and review it. Will we have it in time for the end of session? Thank you, Madam Speaker. If Representative you Hornstein will yield. Representative Hornstein. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker and Leader Doubt. An excellent question. Uh, so the program, uh, uh, the uh, review, the special review, that's what the auditor calls it, is actually already underway. They have taken this on. They agree with us that this is urgent. So. Uh, I understand there have been documents requested and um, work has commenced on the special review. When it will be done, it's unclear. Uh, I don't think um, it will extend it beyond the summer. It could be done uh, in, later in spring. And, um, you know, it really just depends on what the uh, auditor uncovers. I, I wouldn't want to rush the process if they're on to something. That's the nature of an investigation. You find one thing, it leads to another, which leads to another. But I don't think that we will be waiting uh, a year for the results of that. Now, if the Audit Commission, now again, you'll see that language in the bill. If the Audit Commission decides to do this, and I would encourage everybody to check Southwest Audit on your yellow sheet, uh, I'm relatively confident that they will. So that is a larger program evaluation, which will um, be what you would normally see as an audit report with the blue and white cover. And that will be available to us uh, sometime uh, early on in the first quarter, I believe, of uh, uh, 2023. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Petersburg moves to amend House Bill number 3035, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A4. The member from Waseca, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and thank you, Chair Hornstein, for offering this bill. I'm co-author on it, and as I was reviewing, you know, the purpose of this uh, a bill, it talks about what has happened in the past, which kind of left me with the understanding that, you know, not only do we want to know what's happening in the past, but I think we need to kind of stay updated as to what's going on into the future. And so this amendment actually does that. It just requests that the uh, Met Council provide us with a status update twice a year, uh, and I'm sure it's the same reports that they're gonna get from their staff anyway, but it will ask to get us an update on not only the future costs, but also whether or not there's any completion date changes as well. So in essence, it just keeps us informed about what's necessary. And it's as simple as that. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. There is an amendment to the amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. 
Torkelson moves to amend the Petersburg Amendment to House Bill number 3035, the first engrossment. The amendment to the amendment is coded A11. The member from Brown, Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the amendment to the amendment really deals with uh, the project as it's in progress. Uh, we had a uh, meeting the other day, and the uh, chair of Zelly of the Met Council uh, spoke to us, told us that uh, this project is so far down the road and so important that it has to continue. He also acknowledged that the cost of the project is going to go up by another somewhere between 400 and 700 million dollars. Uh, so I asked Chair Zelli, where the heck are you going to get the money? Uh, and frankly, Madam Chair, he did not have a good answer. Uh, apparently, there's not enough money to finish this project on budget. And there's not enough time, there's not enough progress made to finish this project on schedule. Behind schedule, behind budget, yet they want to continue work on this project, even though they have not identified where the additional funds are going to come from, Madam Chair. Uh, I think it's critical that we pull back on the reins, uh, slow this thing down, in fact, stop it until at least, at the very least, we know where the money's coming from to fund the remainder of this project. That's my amendment, Madam Chair. I ask for a green vote. Representative Wolgamott. Madam Speaker, I regretfully rise to a point of order. State your point of order. Well, Madam Speaker, under House Rule 3.21B, an amendment to an amendment on the House floor must relate to only the primary amendment without introducing any new subject. And while I appreciate what the member from Brown is trying to do with the A4 amendment, requiring the Metropolitan Council to provide status updates on the Southwest Light Rail Transit Project pertaining to anticipated expenditures and changes in completion date, unfortunately, the A11 amendment introduces several new subjects. It creates new and separate reporting requirements. It modifies the timeline and the fiscal impacts of the Southwest Light Rail Project. Unfortunately, Madam Speaker, it's not germane, and I respectfully ask that you rule it out of order. Representative Torkelson. I find the point of order well taken. Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we want to do things in order around here, right? Usually I, when somebody stands, they're waiting to be recognized. But uh, I, I just, fire away, Representative Torkelson. Uh, well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, but I, 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 well, anyway, I don't have a permit. Appeal the, I would like to appeal the ruling of the chair and request a roll call, Madam Chair. Madam Speaker. Surprisingly, Representative Torkelson requests uh, to appeal the ruling of the speaker and request a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Would you like to speak to your appeal? Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I have some advice. Uh, you know, the section that uh, Representative Petersburg amendment deals with is titled Southwest Light, Light Rail Transit Expenditures and Schedule. Uh, Madam Chair, that's exactly what my amendment is about. It's about the expenditures and the schedule, as I spoke to earlier. I will not repeat myself, Madam Speaker. I will just request a green... Uh, you'll have to explain to make sure we get the vote right. The question before the body is, shall the decision of the Speaker stand as the judgment of the House? A yes or a green vote supports the ruling of Speaker. A no or a red vote goes against the ruling of the Speaker. See no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the appeal. <laughs> Members, please vote. This is Jill Shirtsworth. St. Paul's teacher. The clerk will call the roll of the members who have not yet voted. Backer. Backer, no. 
Backer, no. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, no. Grunhagen, no. Hamilton. Hamilton, no. Hamilton, no. Houseman. Houseman, I. Houseman, I. Hewitt. Hewitt, I. Hewitt, I. Mason. Mason, I. Mason, I. McDonald. McDonald, no. McDonald, no. Miller. Miller. Moran. Aye. Moran. Moran, I. Moran, I. Munson. Munson, no. Munson, no. New Brindley. New Brindley. Noor. Noor I. Noor I. Thompson. Thompson I. Thompson I. Miller. Miller. New Brindley. New Brindley I. New, New Brindley changes from I to nay. <laughs> you get by with a little help from your friends. The clerk will close the roll. There being 70 ayes and 63 nays, the, it is the judgment of the House that the ruling of the Speaker shall stand. There's another amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Heinrich moves to amend the Petersburg Amendment to House File Number 3035, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A12. The member from Anoka, Representative Heinrich. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, before I explain my amendment, I'd like to request a roll call. Representative Heinrich requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Heinrich. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, we need to pause the funding on this uh, Southwest light rail project and all light rail projects until we see this audit come out. We must find out which mistakes have been made, what we've done wrong, and what we've done right. We want to make sure that as we spend taxpayer dollars, the process is transparent, everything's on the up and up, and we keep the project on the rails. This Southwest light rail project has gone off the rails, members. I encourage a green vote on this amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Ramsey, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to a point of order under Rule 3.21B, and I'm prepared to offer advice. State your advice. So, Madam Speaker, that rule, of course, uh, requires that amendment to amendment relate only to the subject of the primary amendment without introducing any other uh, topic. The uh, primary amendment is the A4 by Representative Petersburg, and he accurately described it as simple. It simply relates to six-month status updates, and this uh, secondary amendment, as Representative Heinrich said, would affect light, multiple light rail projects, their funding, their timing, their fiscal impact. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'd ask you to find the point of order well taken. I find the point of order well taken. Representative Heinrich. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to appeal the ruling of the Speaker and ask for a roll call vote. Representative Heinrich moves to appeal the ruling of the Speaker and requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Heinrich. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, this, uh, this amendment to the amendment is totally germane to the, uh, the original amendment. Uh, it deals with expenditures and, uh, and deals with timelines. We need to pause right now any further money being wasted, taxpayer dollars being wasted on, uh, on these type of projects until we know how to move forward in, in an accurate way. Um, it's, been, it's billions of dollars, members, and our taxpayers, Minnesotans, want to know that as we move forward in any future projects like this, that we have an audit that's done, that we know where we've gone off the rails. We don't want to make any more mistakes. We want to spend taxpayer dollars wisely. And this amendment, Madam Speaker, is germane because it deals with the expenditures. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
The question before the body is, shall the decision of the Speaker stand as a judgment of the House? A yes or a green vote upholds the ruling of the Speaker. A no or a red vote would go against the ruling of the Speaker. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the appeal. <laughs> Members, please vote. Will the clerk please call the names of the members who have not yet voted? Backer. Backer, no. Backer, no. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, no. Grunhagen, no. Hamilton. Hamilton, no. Hamilton, no. Houseman. Houseman, aye. Houseman, aye. Mason. Mason, aye. Mason, aye. McDonald. McDonald, no. McDonald, no. Miller. McDonald, no. Miller. Moran. Moran, aye. Moran, aye. Murphy. Murphy, aye. Murphy, aye. Noor. Noor, aye. Noor, aye. Thompson. Thompson. Miller. Miller. Thompson. The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 ayes and 63 nays, it is the judgment of the House that the ruling of the Speaker shall stand. There is another amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Doubt moves to amend the Petersburg Amendment to House Bill Number 3035, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A. Amendment to the amendment is coded A7. The member from Isanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, this is an amendment that would uh, basically pause the funding on uh, Southwest Light Rail while this, um, this audit is completed. And, and I think that this is really important. Uh, and beyond that, it actually terminates, at the completion of the audit, it terminates Southwest Light Rail uh, completely. So if you want to vote to, to end Southwest Light Rail, this is your vote. Um, and, and believe me, write down on a little notepad in your desk, pull it out, write down on a little notepad that today was the day, write down the date and the time that I gave you the opportunity to vote against Southwest Light Rail. And even just for fun, vote down when they, write, write down when they told you that this project was gonna be done and how much it was gonna cost. And then we'll revisit that in a few years. And I'll have you pull that piece of paper out and, and you can uh, remind yourself that you had the opportunity to vote to kill this project and, and you can see the numbers and, and when they had promised it was going to be done. And I wish that they would have done that and you all remembered what they told you when this project passed the first time. Because we're already, I think, over double now and we're on our way to three or four times the cost. Okay, And that is standard operating procedure when it comes to building rail. And not just here in the state of Minnesota. I'll talk about that a little more. Uh, but probably on third reading. Um, if, if you want to actually do an audit that means something and gives you the opportunity to, to take action, we can't continue to spend money while the audit's happening. We heard from the chair earlier, and believe me, I, I apologize, I did, and I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to ask that question a little bit out of order. I wasn't doing it to set this up, but it, it did happen to work that way. I, I really didn't hear it in your comments, and I really just honestly wanted to know when those would be done. I appreciate that there are two separate uh, reviews of this being done. Um, 
But this audit is not gonna be done for a year, basically. First quarter of next year, that's what I heard. Um, and in the meantime, we're just gonna keep spending. I, I don't know how much, I don't know at what rate we're spending, um, but I assume uh, that this project will be, you know, closer to being finished, and I'm sure they'll probably expend another, who, I mean, who knows? $500 million, a billion dollars, I don't know, between now and then. So if we're not gonna do anything with the audits that we're requesting, why are we doing the audits? If we don't learn anything from the information that we request, why do we do it? I mean, the reality is that this project already, I will say we don't need an audit. We wouldn't need to waste this money on an audit. We could literally just shut this project down. We could just kill it. And believe me, in a few years when this thing isn't done yet and they're asking for even more money and I ask you to pull that little card out of your desk for the few of us that are left here, probably I won't be here, but hopefully somebody will remember that I said this and they'll ask you to pull out that little card and you'll wish that today you would have killed Southwest Light Rail because this is the biggest waste of money that I have ever seen in my lifetime. And we aren't even getting warmed up on how much money this thing's gonna waste, right? They already, just in the last month or two, uh, announced that they needed another $200 million for this project. And at that same meeting, they said, well, we're also going to need another four to 500 million to complete it. All right? I guarantee you that will not be the end. I guarantee it. I've been here 12 years, and I can't say that any more firmly. I guarantee you this thing will overrun the overrun of the overrun of the overrun. There's zero chance that that will be enough money. I guarantee it. And today you'll wish you would have voted for this amendment to kill Southwest Light Rail. So if you want to kill it, this is your opportunity. Ridership is absolutely plummeting and will probably never recover. There are companies that are closing up shop in Minneapolis and moving from permanent uh, in-person to remote work. We absolutely need to reevaluate our spending on these transit projects. This is 1800s technology to solve a modern day problem. And today, they're actually solving that problem with the internet, not with a rail project. You are going to wish that you voted for this. So I'm giving you the opportunity today to vote to kill the project. Here it is. It's the A7 amendment to the A4. And this will pause the money. You probably saw my quote in the newspaper recently. They asked me about what I thought of the, the project and, and should we pause the project while we do the audit? And I said, we should pause it permanently, permanently. When I talk on third reading, I'm gonna talk about some of the other rail lines, both here in Minnesota and in other states. The North Star Line has gotten silly, absolutely silly with the public subsidy to operate it. I will say that when I was Speaker of the House, I already did you a big favor. Because in 2017, we actually passed and, and it was signed into law a bill that would not allow any state dollars to go for the operation of this line. So once we're done wasting money building it, then it's gonna be somebody else's problem. And we did that, we were a little ahead of our time because I knew what was coming. You followed me then. This is your opportunity to follow me on this line. And let's just kill it and be done with it. Instead of putting a, a nail in the in the rail, let's put a nail in the coffin of this project. And believe me, you will thank me for giving you this opportunity. So please don't miss the opportunity. Take the opportunity to kill Southwest Light Rail. Believe me, you'll be glad you did.
So, Madam Speaker, with that, uh, I would ask for members to, to vote in support of this amendment. The member from Hennepin, Representative Howard. Point of order, Madam Speaker. State your point of order. Uh, I rise under point of order uh, rule 3.21B and am prepared to offer advice. State your advice. Madam Speaker, uh, this amendment, as with the previous amendments, uh, expands the scope of the amendment to the amendment uh, in a couple ways, but most notably by uh, eliminating the project in its entirety. I'd ask you to find the uh, amendment not in order. To uh, the point of order, Representative Doubt. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll offer you advice as well. You know, this is really, um, when my amendment is done, there won't be anything left of Southwest Light Rail. So you won't be able to say that I added anything in this amendment to the amendment. This actually removes everything. So in, in the process of the legislature, the rules actually say, and I don't have my rule book open here right now, uh, but it says you can't add anything new. Good news, Madam Speaker, I'm not adding anything. I'm removing it all. I'm getting it all out of the way so we don't waste any more money on this. Southwest Light Rail will be gone. I'm removing it. So that's what the amendment does. It doesn't add anything new. It removes it all. So everybody should vote against the speaker, vote red on this. Let's overturn that. Let's take this amendment, and let's put the nail in the coffin of Southwest Light Rail. Points for creativity, but I find the point of order well taken. Madam Speaker, I uh, move to appeal the ruling of the speaker and request a roll call vote. And my previous speech probably will fit better on this. Representative Doubt requests um, <laughs> appeal. Sorry, uh, appeals the ruling of the speaker and requests a roll call. Both things at the same time. The, seeing there are 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Advice to the body, Representative <laughs> Thank you. Doubt. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that, Madam Speaker. I was actually talking to the body the last time, as if I, as if I was making this speech. But this is the same thing, right? Um, so the rule literally says you, an, an amendment to the amendment, and, and I appreciate Representative Howard. Um, he's right. You can't add anything new. But I'm not adding anything new. And, and so, uh, Representative Howard, because I've been here a little bit longer than you and I have a little more experience, I know the rule, and I know that what I'm actually doing here is I'm removing everything. Um, so I'd, I'd appreciate if members would put up a red vote. Um, let's uh, overturn the ruling of the speaker. Let's take this amendment up. Um, let's add it to the bill, and let's actually put the nail in the coffin of, of Southwest Light Rail uh, once and for good, uh, because that's what needs to happen. Thanks, members. The member from Stearns, Representative O'Driscoll. Well, Madam Speaker, first of all, I want to say how great it is to be back in the chambers with our colleagues and being able to have face-to-face -face debates and discussions like this. I've missed this. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, point of parliamentary inquiry. State your point of parliamentary inquiry. So if a, an amendment has been offered and that amendment asks to um, terminate the particular bill or measure that's in that bill or amendment is no longer germane, then whatever we bring forward can never be modified or terminated as a part of an amendment. Is this going to be precedent that we're setting on how we're going to be handling amendments of this nature in the future? Representative O'Driscoll, that's not a parliamentary inquiry. It's a debate on germaneness, and I've made a ruling on germaneness. So uh, provide your advice to the body. Okay, my advice to the body is just what I asked the speaker. Are we going to, as a body, say when we don't like something, we're not going to vote on it, we're going to rule it uh, not germane? And the germaneness is whether we want to talk about it or not. It's very simple. Now, we both, uh, both sides have been involved in this in the past where we brought things that maybe expand and don't expand. This clearly is. Do we or do we not? Yes or no? And now we're arguing germaneness all the way down to this. This is what this body has come to. My goodness. We're afraid of our own shadow. I realize it's the 3rd of, excuse me, the, yeah, the 3rd of March. We missed Groundhog's Day by a month, but we're afraid of our shadow here. But thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the appeal.
Members, please vote. Here we go. Will the Chief Clerk please call the names of the members who have not voted yet? Backer. Backer, no. Backer, no. Bierman. Bierman, aye. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, no. Grunhagen, no. Hamilton. Hamilton, no. Hamilton, no. Houseman. Houseman, aye. Houseman, aye. Johnson. Johnson, no. Johnson, no. Mason. Mason, aye. Mason, aye. McDonald. McDonald, no. McDonald, no. Miller. Excused. Miller, excused. Moran. Moran, aye. Moran, aye. Thompson. Thompson, aye. Thompson, aye. The clerk will close the roll. There being 70 ayes and 63 nays, it is the judgment of the House that the decision of the Speaker shall stand. There is another amendment to the amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> West moves to amend the Petersburg Amendment, the House Law Number 3035, the first engrossment. The amendment to the amendment is coded A-5. The member from Anoka, Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, our, uh, so far our amendments haven't had a good track record. We haven't even gotten to a real vote. But my amendment is so eminently reasonable, I think we can make it there. So my amendment makes it so if this project runs over 5% over cost in the future, which it will, which it will or if it's delayed by uh, six months or more, which is also probably will happen, that the legislature, that the Met Council must immediately, not just, you know, annually or whenever, they immediately must report it to the ranking minority members on the committees as well as the chairs. And that's important because it actually makes this public. When, you know, if you think about in the private sector, if you say something's going to cost a billion dollars and then you come back and say it costs 2.2 billion dollars or more, well, we need to know exactly how that happened and exactly what's going on there. Because this is taxpayer money and boatloads, boatloads of it at that. So with my amendment, we can make sure we get some accountability here and transparency and bring the public into the loop. Because right now, nobody has no idea what's going on. So thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, thank you, uh, Representative West. I think this is a good amendment. It keeps in the spirit of uh, what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, I would just simply say immediately can be construed in many ways. So um, I think a reasonable amount of time, a few days a week, something like that, I think would be fine. But I'll take this amendment, and I appreciate your bringing it. I would encourage members to vote yes. Representative Doubt. Uh, would the author of the amendment yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Doubt. I apologize. There was some con uh, conversation about when those notices would come to us. Do you know? Can you clarify for me, uh, Representative West, how soon those would happen after there's a 5% overrun or a s goes beyond six months of the uh, extension of the estimated date? Representative West. My amendment makes it happen immediately. So when they know, they have to report it to the committees. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and um, Representative West, thank you. I, I do appreciate that. Um, if we could have them directed to our cell phones, because um, this one's going to sound like your uh, text messages on a really busy news day. It's going to be ding, 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 ding. Every time this thing goes over 5% and every time it goes beyond six months, um, it's, it's good, just going to go crazy. So um, I, I can't wait to get those notices. Uh, so remember to write that all down on that sheet uh, and we'll revisit this. Thank you. Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, I would like to request a roll call as well. Representative West requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Any further discussion? The clerk will take the roll on the West Amendment to the Amendment.
Members, please vote. Will the clerk please call the names of the members who have not yet voted? Backer. Backer, both aye. Backer, aye. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, aye. Grunhagen, aye. Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Hamilton, aye. Houseman. Houseman, aye. Houseman, aye. Mariani. Mariani, aye. Mariani, aye. Mason. Mason, aye. Mason, aye. McDonald. McDonald, aye. McDonald, aye. Moran. Moran, aye. Moran, aye. Murphy. Murphy, aye. Murphy, aye. Stevenson. Stevenson. Thompson. Thompson, aye. Thompson, aye. Stevenson. Stevenson. The clerk will close the roll. There being 132 ayes and zero nays, the amendment to the amendment is adopted. We are on the Petersburg Amendment as amended. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I appreciate uh, this opportunity to, to review again. This amendment as amended really does give us an opportunity to keep a, at least a anticipation of understanding what the process is moving forward, what kind of costs are being uh, dealt with and what kind of delays that might be there. And I think it's important for us, if it's important for us to know what the outcome of the audit is, it is important for us to know what the future is holding as well. And so um, I just appreciate your, your green vote, and uh, Madam Speaker, I would request a roll call. Representative Peterson requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Madam Speaker, members. And like the previous amendment, I think this keeps, uh, uh, keeps us on track with our theme here of uh, accountability, transparency. It's a good amendment. Representative Petersburg, I appreciate your... Uh, uh, bringing forward, and I'd encourage a green yes vote on the uh, Petersburg Amendment. See no further discussion on the amendment as amended. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. <laughs> Members, please vote. Will the Chief Clerk please call the names of the members who have not yet voted? Backer. Backer, aye. Backer, aye. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, aye. Grunhagen, aye. Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Hamilton, aye. Houseman. Houseman, aye. Houseman, aye. Mariani. Mariani, aye. Mariani, aye. Mason. Mason, aye. Mason, aye. McDonald. McDonald, aye. McDonald, aye. Moran. Excused. Excused. Murphy. Murphy, aye. Murphy, aye. Ryer. Ryer, aye. Thompson. Thompson, aye. Thompson, aye. The clerk will close the roll.
There being 132 ayes and zero nays, the amendment is adopted. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House Bill number 3035, as amended. Third reading, as amended. Discussion to the bill. The member from Isanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, I appreciate the uh, uh, ability to offer those amendments. I wish we had taken them, but um, I, I understand uh, that uh, you know you want to. Um, preserve the, the, the Southwest Light Rail project. Um, but unfortunately, uh, this project, like many others uh, before it, and in many other places, is an absolute waste of money. Um, I remember uh, before my time in the legislature, uh, they passed the uh, North Star um, commuter rail project. Uh, and I've got some ridership numbers on that. Um, just to give you an idea on North Star, what has happened. I used to have in my stump speech, and I've said it here on the, on the House floor a few times, um, that the, the public subsidy to take one commuter from Big Lake or Elk River, pick your city, Anoka, and, and get them into Minneapolis to work, um, they pay, I don't even know, but I think maybe about eight bucks for the round trip ticket. Um, and the public subsidy for the one-way ride used to be $44. And, and as I traveled around the state and talked about that project, I talked about the fact that the, the government, or, or using your tax dollars, subsidized every single ride for 44 bucks. So that meant if, if um, somebody was riding to work, it was $44, and to get them home, it was another 44 bucks. So $88 per person per day. I mean, you literally extrapolate that out. We could have leased a brand new Mercedes for every single person that rode North Star commuter rail, paid for all of their gas, and still had money left over. That's how obnoxiously inefficient and wasteful that that project is. Um, we, uh, and, and that was then, when the ridership was probably half of what the estimates were when they, when they sold that bill of goods to us. But now, the ridership is one-tenth, or excuse, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I almost thought that was a misprint. It's one-tenth of what it was then. Prior to the pandemic, they, were, they had, in January of 2020, total monthly riders, 56,575. That was the number of rides. January 2022, 3,977. 189 people a day. 189 rides, rides a day. I mean, we are talking about almost $1,000 per person per day. Think about that. That's what we're subsidizing to get one person to work in Minneapolis and back. And by the way, nobody's working in Minneapolis, right? They've solved this problem with fiber optic cables, not with rail. So literally, almost $1,000 per person per day. You extrapolate that out, the number of work days in a month, months in a year, you're talking like $240,000 per person to get somebody to their job and back. I used to say you could lease them a Mercedes and pay for their gas, but you know what you can do now? We could lease a helicopter to pick them up at their home and bring them into Minneapolis and then bring them back home. Literally, you could lease a helicopter to fly them to work and back every day. That's how inefficient these lines are. And that's what you're doing if we continue this project. Now all of a sudden, you know, we're in an election year where it looks like off the shore there might be a bit of a wave building. And now we're going to, you know, take a vote to do an audit. 
that won't be done for another year. In the meantime, we're going to waste another half a billion dollars on this project. And then when we get the thing back, you're going to say, well, <laughs> it's, I almost sounded like a senator there. Um, you're, you're going to say, well, it's, it's too late now. We've spent too much money. We can't turn back. You know what? North Star is operating right now. And the counties along the line want to shut it down. Even if we have to pay the money back to the federal government, the match that we got from the feds, it would still be worth it to those counties to shut the line down. Right? On this particular line, we did some math. If I can find it. This is what an inch of rail looks like. Right here. This is a piece of rail that is one inch of rail. Okay? Do you know how much this project will cost? $322.50 per inch. Does that sound like a lot? That sound like, what? What? No way. Wait a second. It can't be. Three, my paper says that, but again, I thought that was a misprint. $3,200 per inch. For how many miles? How many miles is this thing? 12 miles, 14 miles? 14 and a half miles at $3,000 per inch? And we're going to audit. It's going to take a year to get the audit back. Oh, and by the way, we're not going to pause the project while we wait to hear if it's actually uh, makes sense to move forward. We're actually just going to move forward. There's a, I want you guys to, to, to do something. Uh, Google Oahu Rail Project. Yep on the island of Oahu in the state of Hawaii, they are building a rail project. If any of you have been there any time in the last 20 years, you've seen the construction on it. They passed it, actually not 20 years, 10 years. They passed it in 2012. They signed the contract. It's a 20 mile project. It is not yet 60% completed. And it is already, got to find the number here. It's already at, I think, $13 billion. And it's 65% complete. And you know what the new estimated completion date is? 2031. For a rail project. This is one of those projects where before they get done with the project, they're going to have to start replacing the infrastructure from the beginning of the construction because the weathering and aging of the infrastructure is going to make it obsolete. But this is your solution. This is your solution in, in the modern era. We're going to use 1800s technology to move people around. I can't, you can't make this up. And in the meantime, our governor wants $200 million to start construct or start planning of uh, Botno light rail line. And we had an opportunity today to pause that one until we get the results back from this one. I don't know if somebody can go back real quick and look at what the estimated cost of this project was when it was originally approved. And I don't know what year that happened in, the Southwest light rail but what that original estimate was. 1.2 billion is what I'm told. We're already over 2 billion. I think, we're, I think we're actually double the original number. And right now they're telling us that it's already gonna be another four or $500 million for this project. So when we make decisions based off of information like, I can't imagine how these Hawaii legislators feel. Um, they got a project that's going to take 20 years to get to completion. And by the way, that's just the estimate right now. 
that it's going to be another nine years. I'm sure they won't have another overrun. I'm sure they won't have another delay, right? I'm sure it'll end on time. Which is what the problem is going to be with this one. It's what it has been. It's the history. It will be that again. Is it acceptable for us as policymakers to get information in a study that says that something's going to cost $1.2 billion and it eventually costs maybe three times that? Is that acceptable? No, it's not. There isn't anything acceptable about that. If you ran a business, let's say you're building a house and you put the, the, the plans out for bid or you sign a contract with a builder and you think that house is going to cost $200,000 and it's going to be done in six months. But as you get to two months in, they now say it's going to, well, it's going to be 400000 now. What? Yeah, and you signed a contract, and you know what? We already started building this thing, um, so we can't really turn back now. And then you get four months in, and they say, well, you know, we're going to push this out. It's actually going to be a year, maybe a year and a half, we're not sure. Probably going to be 600000 Would you accept that? Is there any of you that could look any one of your taxpayers in the face and say that you think that's an acceptable way to spend tax dollars? And I haven't even talked about the fact that the ridership estimates on these things are so overblown in these initial studies. There isn't a single line that has met its ridership estimates. There isn't a single line that's gotten anywhere close. So now... The taxpayers are stuck holding the bag for North Star to the tune of about 880 bucks a day per person that rides that thing. I would never suggest this, but maybe we could pay somebody's internet connection for 80 bucks a month and they could work from home. Because they're probably working from home already. And we could save ourselves, I don't know, $239,000 per person per year? You run your family budget like that? Would you, would you build that house? Would you close on that home? Or would you walk away and say, I'm not doing that, sorry. I've seen bait and switch before. I'm not that stupid. Or should we double down? I, 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 I'm going to give you credit. I appreciate the fact that we're doing an audit. But an audit with no action and an audit with no time to take action just looks like an election year safety net for you. Do we really think that Minnesotans are going to believe that you're holding anybody accountable? There isn't a lick of language in this bill that holds a single person accountable. Thank God that when I was speaker in 2017, we passed and signed into law language that said the state taxpayers are not on the hook for the operating of this line. But unfortunately, we're still on the hook for the construction of it, or at least the 10 or 20 percent that the state pays for. But it doesn't matter. It's all taxpayer dollars. It's not like there's money that grows on trees and we can say, well, only 10 percent of it or 20 percent of it is ours. It's all ours. Some comes through county taxes, some comes through federal taxes, and some comes through state taxes. But it's all your money. And I think at some point, some engineer or, or you know, uh, consultant that got paid some percentage of this project ran all the way to the bank with big bags of money saying, gosh, we got that one done and the taxpayers got screwed. And by the way, there's a stop right outside of our office building, and I don't see a single one of you riding the train. You know why? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, Frank Hornstein rides the train. He does. <laughs> Do you 
Dabney rides the train. I have not seen you. I have not seen you. I need to move my desk to the other window so I can see who's getting on the train. But the reality is, and I watch when I'm headed home or coming in, the other day I counted, there was nine people on one, one train. Nine people. On a train that has a capacity of probably 400. And I counted. I could see in the windows the heads as they went by. And I counted them. Nine people. And that's the problem. That's the problem with North Star. That's the pro and by the way, those nine people, a lot of them aren't paying the fare box. A lot of them aren't buying a ticket. And you know what? Nobody's doing anything about that either. That's been a constant problem since this thing opened up. Not to mention the crime on these trains. The people sleeping on the trains. This is a failed experiment and a bad idea. And we should never have done them. It's a monumental waste of money. You want to do transit? Do a bus a bus line. These bus lines, there's, I think, that one that goes down towards uh, uh, Egan or Apple Valley, somewhere down there, gets, a, gets a, a fare box recovery of, like, I think the subsidy on it's $1.20, or at least it was a, a while ago. $1.20 per person we're subsidizing. But the North Star, put it on a rail, we're subsidizing, you know, 800 bucks per person. I mean, it's silly. So, you know, and actually I know why you do it too, because with a rail, there's a lot of flexibility, right? You can just pick up the tracks and move it if the need moves, right? And no expense, just pick them up and move them. That's no problem, right? Like a bus, we could just drive it on a different road. But, you know, I, I can keep saying these stupid things so you realize how stupid it is to build these projects and what a monumental waste of money they are. But I think you get the point. $3,225 per inch. There's the rail, one inch, $3,225. Over $2 billion, billion dollars, to run a train to a suburb. I think we need to ask ourselves, how many people is this going to impact? How many people are actually going to ride it? Not the inflated estimates that we use to pull the wool over policymakers' eyes, the real numbers. And we know that because we can look at the real numbers on the existing rail lines. And I'll bet that the actual numbers right now for what's riding North Star is less than 5% of the bill of goods estimate that they sold us when they pass that line. And you need to ask yourself if you think that's okay. Because you have the data. You know the real world results, ridership, usership, utilization of these lines. And they are a failure. So members, while I encourage people to vote to do this audit, unfortunately there's zero teeth in this bill. It won't allow us any time this session to act on the bill, to actually stop this line. And while this may make you feel good in an election year, it will do nothing to actually protect the taxpayers from this multi-billion dollar boondoggle. And please, write that note and put it in your desk. And please, Google search Oahu Rail Project and read the newspaper articles about that project. Because these rail projects are 1800 technology to solve a modern day problem. And I have a feeling that you're all smarter than that. So please vote uh, in favor of this audit, but don't feel good about yourself when you're doing it because you haven't put any teeth into this bill. The member from Anoka, Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So I've served on the Transportation Committee every single year I've been in the legislature. And my sole purpose for serving on that committee is to rebuild Highway 65. So seeing a billion dollars blown like this, and two billion dollars now, 
it hurts my soul. For Highway 65, we only need 100, 200 million dollars, and it would help a ton more people. It's Republican and Democrats alike. We could, for two billion dollars, we could build Highway 65 from Minneapolis all the way up to Mora. It's, this is a mind-boggling waste of money. And we have our own little boondoggle in Anoka County, North Star. We knew that was going to be a waste of money. It was built anyways. And we tried to warn you guys. We tried to say Southwest right, Light Rail is not a good use of taxpayer dollars. It's not going to pay for itself. But I don't even know if we even thought it would over double in cost. Over $2 billion. Imagine if we spent that money on roads and bridges that people actually use in your district or in your neighborhood. It's not just one. We could do a lot with $2 billion. And we just can't treat taxpayer dollars like this. It is a phenomenal waste. But thankfully, this bill is at least a step in the right direction. So I plan on voting for it. We need an audit. We need to really understand exactly how much money is being blown and why it's going on longer and longer and longer and costing more and more money. So, It'd be great to scrap this whole project and use the money for something we actually need, like Highway 65, but this at least is a step in the right direction. We got to get to the bottom of it, find these costs, and hopefully we can just decide, eh, it was a bad idea anyways. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. <clears throat> We've talked uh, about this project over the years quite a bit, and more recently we had a, an update in the Transportation Committee. And now, so we know that we're $700 million potentially, potentially more, over budget, and where the heck are you going to get those funds, was asked. Representative Torkelson asked that question. Where the heck are you going to get those funds? And I asked that across the aisle. We asked that in the committee. Where the heck are you going to get the funds? And the answer that the Met Council chair gave was maybe our federal partners, maybe within the Met Council, maybe at Hennepin County, the local partners. And I appreciated that answer because he left out the state, because we've already put in enough money and taxpayers are done. And I hope he sticks true to that and we don't see a funding request to fill in this amazing, amazing overrun that has nearly tripled the cost of this project. And then in the hearing, I'd like to share with you members that they mentioned that it is disappointing that we are over budget by nearly tripling the cost. Disappointing. I don't think anybody disagrees that it's disappointing that we're over budget and behind schedule. But really, this is embarrassing that as a state, we've spent this much money and we are nearly three times over budget in the cost of that. And it's embarrassing that the Met Council in Hennepin County allowed the project to get to this stage that they are nearly three times over budget. But it's, it is disappointing and it is shameful or excuse me, it's disappointing and it's embarrassing, but really it's shameful that we didn't take these amendments. A representative from the St. Cloud area objected ruling an amendment out of order that we should stop all this funding. Great courage and political, or, and great courage and fiscal responsibility to call that out of order. Don't kid yourselves that this audit is much and fiscal responsibility. What we should have done is accepted that amendment because it's shameful that while we're three times over budget on this project, Governor Waltz in a spending spree in his supplemental budget asked for another $200 million on another sure-to-be boondoggle that that project will probably be two or three times over budget based on the history of these projects. And it might be worth noting that we asked in this committee hearing, what's the operating cost going to be on this other Blue Line extension project? 
What's the annual operating subsidy that, or loss that we know it will be? What is it going to cost to operate this line annually over the next year? And what is the final estimated cost? And do you know what the Met Council said to us? Well, we haven't calculated that out. We don't know how much it's going to cost to operate, and we don't know how much that other line's going to cost to build. But we know we're almost three times over budget on the Southwest project, and we have the shameful supplemental request for another project to get started at the same time, and adding $200 million on that. Representative West made a great point, and maybe there's another project in one of your, your districts that we could use that $200 million for to get people to where they need to be and help our businesses get their products to where they need to be. So it's not just disappointing, it's not just embarrassing, it's shameful that we continue to spend money even during this audit. And so members, I'm disappointed that you have this bravado of fiscal conservativeness being the taxpayer watchdog, but at the same time, you forget to let your constituents know you're starting a second boondoggle at the same time. So, Chair Hornstein, I hope at the end of this session when we have our transportation bill, you'll take my comments well advised and, say, and not fund the $200 million request for another project until we get this one under control. That would be my ask, members. That's the fiscal conservative thing to do, in addition to just stopping this project until this audit is done and we get it back on track or kill it altogether. So I will be supporting your audit, but there's so much more that we can do. And so, members, let's keep in mind that this is disappointing, this is embarrassing, this is shameful, and we should stop this project altogether. But the audit is a fine thing, doesn't hurt anything, but it's really shameful that we spend taxpayer monies without much oversight to begin with. The member from Wright, Representative Lucero. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. This is a very important topic that we're discussing. And I want to thank my, my friend, uh, Chair Hornstein, for bringing this bill. But Madam Speaker, I have to ask you, do you know who my favorite Democrat is? And I'm sorry, Madam Speaker, it's not you. It is indeed my friend, Chair Hornstein. In fact, uh, last, it, was, it must have been yeah, last year, we were in bonding committee. Uh, he was waiting for a bill hearing. Uh, I think it was Representative Murphy brought up uh, some chili somehow, and then Representative uh, Chair Hornstein sent me chili, and my wife and I have uh, enjoyed some of the best chili that's out there. And I'm looking forward to, when the session's over, Madam Speaker, inviting Representative Hornstein over, and we're going to cook him a good dinner. But there are problems with this bill, as we've heard. There isn't accountability, and we won't be able to take action until next year. I wish uh, Representative Doubt was still here. He's off the floor at the moment. So I'll ask Representative New to yield. She will yield. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative New. I've been here for eight years. We heard remarks that Representative Doubt said that the state is prevented from uh, they're, they're spending money on Southwest Light Rail. Could you just remind myself and the body who was in the majority when that law was passed, when that law was passed, and who's responsible for saving taxpayers those dollars? The member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Lucero. Uh, Republicans were taxpayer watchdogs on this. Uh, we made sure, uh, especially after knowing the expenses of the North Star commuter rail, commuter rail I, honestly, I was shocked to hear that today when Leader Doubt pointed out that we could literally lease a helicopter to get people to and from work for what we are paying on the subsidy for North Star Commuter Rail. That was 
shocking. So thank heavens, Republicans did the right thing to protect the taxpayer from the same subsidies on Southwest Light Rail. Representative Lucero. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative New, for, for reminding us of that. The leadership of Republicans. And when this report comes back next year, I suspect Republicans are going to be in the majority again to be able to take the wise actions that will be necessary. Madam Speaker, Representative Doubt referred to writing down his words and putting them in the drawer and save them. But at the rate it's taking and the delays, I think right now it's 2027 and we know it'll be years beyond that. We can't just put those notes in a drawer and pull them out later. We're going to have to put them in a time capsule. In a time capsule. And you know what? The dirt is still uncovered over there in Southwest. We could bury this time capsule in the line that they're, they're currently uh, digging up. And in years from now, years, we could pull that out and look at the words that were spoken. We speak about the cost. Right now it's two, estimated $2.75 billion. But you know what, Madam Speaker? The $2.75 billion estimated cost doesn't factor in the Democrat tax and spend and Biden inflation. The Biden inflation that's inflicting high prices on hardworking Minnesotans across the state and hardworking Americans across the country are, is the same Biden inflation that's going to drive up the cost of materials as the years tick by to finish this terrible line. So we know that the state is prevented from these cost overruns. And we know that it's already going to take an estimated four to five hundred million that Representative Dowd had mentioned. So if the state can't pay for that, who's going to pay for it? Which entity is going to pay for that? And Madam Speaker, it's going to be Hennepin County. It's going to be Hennepin County. And when I say Hennepin County, it's going to be the taxpayers of Hennepin County. And so, Madam Speaker, would Representative Jordan yield for a question? She will yield. Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Jordan, for yielding. This morning in the bonding committee, we had a discussion about lead pipes, and one of the bills that uh, you were speaking about seeks to prioritize concentrations of poverty and opportunity zones, as you mentioned in the committee this morning. And when I asked where some of those are, one of the answers was North Minneapolis. Well, North Minneapolis is obviously in Hennepin County. So, Madam Speaker and Representative Jordan, these cost overruns, hundreds of millions of dollars that are going to be borne by Hennepin County, do you think some of these people that live in these opportunity zones and high concentrations of poverty in Hennepin County should be the ones paying for this? Representative Jordan. Madam Speaker, Representative Lucero, can you repeat the question? Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. High concentrations in po of poverty in Hennepin County, should they be paying for the cost overruns? Representative Jordan. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Lucero. I'm not familiar with the cost overruns, but I think it's important that pub the public pay for public goods, and transit is a public good, and so all of the public should pay for these public goods. Representative Lucero. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, not all over the state of Minnesota, because of the wisdom of the Republican majority, and I won't ask any more questions, because of the, the, the wisdom of the Republican majority, not all taxpayers are going to pay for it. Thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord because of the wisdom of the Republican majority. But this cost is going to be paid, and it's going to be picked up. The tab will be picked up by Hennepin County. And it'll be picked up by those residents of Hennepin County, such as North Minneapolis residents, high concentrations of poverty. That's where Democrats are putting the bill. They're putting the bill on those that can least afford it. Madam Speaker, in my research here, I looked at this line. I saw Representative Dowd hold up the one inch 
it's worth $3,000 right now an inch to construct Southwest Light Rail. Right now, I didn't look it up, but I think gold spot, one ounce gold is trading in the neighborhood of 2,000, 1,900, 2,000 an ounce. So this one inch of Southwest Light Rail is more than an ounce of gold right now. If I had the opportunity, and right now with the Biden inflation, Madam Speaker, do you know what people across Minnesota and across the country are doing to hedge against inflation? The Biden inflation that's being inflicted on hardworking people? They're buying precious metal and gold. But, but, what was that? Yeah, the green line. Yeah, exactly, the green line. But, the one inch is worth more than the precious metal that people are paying to hedge against the Biden inflation. So in the research I was doing, Madam Speaker, I have a map here looking at the, where the line goes, and I counted the number of stops, and I'm, I'm, I presume this map is accurate, but I do know that the cost overruns had in the past resulted in having to eliminate some of the, the stops. So this map has 17 stops. There might be more, there might be less at this point. But regardless of the number of stops, According to my research here, in 2000, the Met, this legislature afforded the Met Council the authority, what does it say here? To sell or lease naming rights to light rail transit stations. So these light rail transit stations can have names. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to help the Met Council. I put together some names, some suggested names that the Met Council could name these train stations. So, Madam Speaker, here's just a couple. And I'm not super, I'm not Mr. Creative. I'm sure others could maybe come up with better names, but here's some names that I came up with. One of the stations could be called the Democrat Disaster. We could name another light rail station stop, the Walls Waste. We could name another one, Met Council Scammers. Madam Speaker, we could call one of the stations the McLaughlin Monstrosity. Madam Speaker, another station could be named the Dayton Reality Denier. Madam Speaker, and this one, I can't take credit for this, Madam Speaker, this one is actually Representative Raleigh's idea. The OPAT Oh No. Madam Speaker, we could call one, actually there's enough room here, enough train stops to call one the Kenilworth Condo Crumble or, or and, the Kenilworth Colossal Failure. Madam Speaker, another one could be called the Slawick Boondoggle. Another stop, uh, stop could be called the Southwest Money Pit. And actually that one is from Representative West. And when he came up with the name The Money Pit, I thought of the movie The Money Pit, but that's exactly what this is. For those who've seen the movie The Money Pit, where the house is falling apart as he's trying to renovate the thing, that's what this is. The Southwest Light Rail is just causing things to fall apart and flood. And Madam Speaker, here's one last one that I came up with, the Dunnick Don't Stop. So Madam Speaker, I will conclude with this. Unlike Representative West, who has had the honor of serving on the Transportation Committee his entire time in office, I have not. I've had the privilege of serving with Representative or Chair Hornstein on the Transportation Committee only half of my time here in office, four years. And in those four years, this topic had come up numerous times, and one of the testifiers, one of the residents from the Kenilworth neighborhood came and gave adamant testimony against this project. And I was so intrigued, Madam Speaker, by her testimony, I connected with her afterwards, after the committee, and I went out there. So Representative Hornstein, Madam Speaker and Representative Hornstein, I've been out to, this was before the, even the first shovel of dirt had turned over, and I walked the trail back there. Beautiful area, Madam Speaker and Chair Hornstein. It's a beautiful community back there. Very, very beautiful. Lots of trees, 
lots of beautiful trees, and I recall that the, the resident there was very concerned about all the mature trees that were gonna be cut down, which I'm sure by this point, I've not been back since then, but I'm sure all those trees are wiped out. I've seen the condo that we've read, the former grain storage buildings that were converted to condos. I walked right by them, and she expressed the concern. And look what happened. Her concern became reality. And so it's so unfortunate that, that the Democrat majority has just plowed ahead with this hub and spoke model, this out of date 1800s technology rail that has the assumption that people want to come to the center core of Minneapolis. They assume that people in the suburbs want to travel to the inner core to work, hence the hub and spoke model, all these different proposed lines fanning out from Minneapolis to bring people in. It's a faulty assumption because we now see right now, why would you want to go to Minneapolis to get carjacked? Why would I want to go to Minneapolis to have bullets? You know, we just had, uh, it was Representative Edelson, Madam Speaker. There was a bill and her police chief, I think it was Edina, had said that carjackings are up from 3,000 to 6,000 a year. So the, the, the faulty assumption that people want to travel into the inner core is the reason why, as Representative Doubt pointed out, nine people on the train. Nine people. So, Madam Speaker, this bill is a good start, but we need to terminate this project. It's a boondoggle, it's a waste of money, it's legacy thinking, and it's not something that any taxpayer should pay anywhere. So while I encourage a green vote on this, we need and should do more to stop this terrible waste of money. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, earlier today, I was in the rotunda having my office hours, as I have been lately, and the folks from the History Center stopped by and they gave me a History Matters button uh, because today is History Day. And I thought it was very timely because the history of this project matters. And Representative Hornstein, let me start off by saying thank you for bringing this audit bill. I am going to be voting green. And you've heard Representative Dowd and a few others reference the bill that took the state off the hook. Uh, that's me, so if you want to hate on anybody, that was what well, you do already. But uh, if you want to hate on somebody for this, that was my bill that, it's amazing what you can dream up in a deer stand when the deer aren't moving. But I thought then, and it's been confirmed now, that this project was going to be over budget, behind on schedule. It was going to have a lot of problems that some of us were talking about well in advance of it even being where it is today. So then Chair Torkelson, and I think he's here somewhere, there he is. Chair Torkelson, I was super excited. I was in my second term and I thought that we could do everything. And I ran up to him, I said, Paul, I've got this great bill. And he patted me on the shoulder. He said, well, it's a great idea, but it'll never become law. But thanks to the leadership of the chair and other folks, we got it put into a bill. It got signed into law. And now the state is off the hook. But that doesn't take away from the fact that, that this is a bad project. And I wanted to walk through a few things. And Chair Hornstein, you and I have spoken about this a number of times. This is. This is really costing now the Hennepin County taxpayer a lot, but the state was on the hook for quite a bit. But we heard things leading up to really the, a little bit after kickoff of this project, that it was going to have implications that had not been thought about. So Madam Speaker, if the chair would yield to a question. He will yield, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Ms. Uh, Chair Hornstein, you and I were on, I believe, the uh, subcommittee on metropolitan governance. We had a meeting over in the Taj Mahal, I mean the Senate office building, and we were listening to testimony about the condominiums that we now have seen in the news. But my question is, what was the message that we were getting in that meeting 
very, very clearly from the people who were living along those lines as they were trying to do the various pile drivings that they were doing. Representative Hornstein. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, Representative Nash, yes, um, I had carried legislation several times uh, dating back five years ago uh, out of uh, a lot of concern um, for uh, the people that live there and the accountability that they need and deserve. And um, I think right now we're seeing that they and as others had predicted, there would be problems. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Chair Hornstein, thank you for that. We sat in that meeting and we heard from not just the residents, but they had gone to the trouble and I believe they hired a, a couple of different geotechnical engineers. Uh, I think that's right, Chair Hornstein. And they had, they had brought us lots of information. They said, if we do this, this is what's going to happen. And a lot of us that were on that commission and in that meeting, we raised our hands and we said, we should slow this down before we can actually vet, so we can vet this out. We were told by the Met Council, no, 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 it's fine. It's going to be fine. Everyone's going to be happy. We can do this. Fast forward to recent times, recent months, and we found out that the residents and their geotechnical engineers were spot on. That these townhomes, these condominiums are now looking at major structural damage. And we don't know what the outcome of that is, but it, it could mean that they're not able to inhabit their townhomes anymore if it's uh, worse than, than we, we've heard. So in the name of this project that we have been talking about for a very long time being perhaps unnecessary at best, they are now disrupting people's lives. That cost is going to be, be borne by somebody if we have to pay people out for the loss of their home or the mitigation of the problems that are going along with it. And Chair Hornstein and Madam Speaker, if he would yield. He will yield. Representative Nash. Thanks. Uh, Chair Hornstein, have you gotten a, a rough estimate on what some of those mitigation costs might be? I haven't seen that, but I, I know you're a little closer to this. Have you seen those numbers? Representative Hornstein. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Nash, I uh, was at a meeting a couple weeks ago with residents, and uh, that information was requested, and we are we're waiting to hear. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I, I'm guessing, and I'm not a math major, but it's going to be a big number, and it's it may be something that none of us could possibly imagine. And I just want you to think about: a lot of us have been talking about this for years. And we talked about the fact that this was something that we should not do over the objection of people who were bringing legitimate concerns to us. But it, it just went on anyway. Another example I'll bring to you. The Southwest Transportation bus line had a fantastic bus depot in Eden Prairie. And they were actually moving people at a very affordable rate. And they were doing it well, they were executing well, and they did a nice job. And that depot is now gone. All in the name of the Southwest Light Rail Depot train station in Eden Prairie. And I can tell you in having spoken to the folks from Southwest, uh, they were more than happy, able, willing, and capable of moving people cheaper than this train line. They could vary their times, they could vary their routes, they could upsize the bus, they could downsize the bus. All of those things are possible with bus, but they are virtually impossible with a train that doesn't even run. So members, this is a very good bill, and Chair Hornstein, I, I am going to be honest, I'm very grateful for this, and you and I have spoken in your office. The audit is going to be an important piece, but what we do with that audit, what we act on as a result of the information that we get from the OLA is going to be critical. You know, for those of us that, that played baseball at various levels, you could kind of watch the pitcher and you could watch the infield and you could see what they were doing and they were preparing for the play. That's what we need to do now, Chair Hornstein. We need to prepare for that next pitch, and that next pitch is us stepping forward, taking action to change the behavior of something that is really egregious. 
And I would like to, moving forward, do the same bill that I did for this, for all rail projects moving forward, because it, it's just, it, it's a lot of talk and not a lot of delivery. So members, I know that some of you live in communities that are going to be served by this, but you should rush towards the green button on this bill. And similarly, you should rush towards voting for the, green, for the bill that comes out of what to do next. This is a waste of money. It is going to take forever to get done. People's lives are being disrupted, whether it's the people who live in a townhome or live along the projected rail line. Or when I was also in the majority last and it was in the Transportation Committee, Chair Hornstein, you also voted for the bill that I brought that would, uh, would make the Met Council pay the same as anybody else did for eminent domain, which is, we all know, is stealing land. But we required, and I thank you then and I thank you again, to make sure that those people that were being disrupted were going to be paid the same as a city or a township or a county, because at that time, the Met Council had a much lower sweetheart deal that had been put into position for, for them by somebody. So, members, as you're thinking about what to do with this bill, and I hope that it's a straight green board, think about what happens next. Think about what's going to come out of the OLA, because I can guarantee you it'll be eye-popping. But in there, as the OLA reports always do, they have what steps need to be taken. And I, after years of being here, the OLA reports, oh, in my opinion, sometimes they're a little reserved. I would like them to be a little more fiery. And now that we have a new OLA, and I miss Mr. Nobles very much, but maybe Ms. Randall will get a little spicy on this one because we need it. So many things have gone wrong with Southwest. So many things will continue to go wrong with Southwest, but this audit is a great step in the right direction. Mr. Chair, thank you for this. Members, vote green. The member from Hennepin, Representative Elkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in support of this bill. Right now, we're paralyzed by an epidemic of finger pointing. But by commissioning this report from the OLA to conduct an impartial analysis of how we got here and what we will be, we will be provided with the information that we need to avoid repeating the mistakes that have gone put us in this position and will establish a solid baseline for the project going forward. We are, let's make no bones about it, past the point of no return on this project. The project is 60% complete, and it would cost us more to stop the project at this point than it will to complete it. We will have to repay $900 million that the Feds have, uh, feds have uh, fronted to us to, to construct this project, and we would have to deconstruct everything that has been built already and restore the line to its original condition. The cities along the line have already invested millions of their own taxpayer dollars in new redevelopment projects adjacent to the stops around the route that are worth hundreds of millions of, of dollars. And I would remind the members that uh, this is the third of our, of our plan for LRT lines. The first, first two lines, the Hiawatha line that was built during the Plenty administration and the University line that was built during the... Um, uh, Dayton administration were both brought in on time and under budget. So this project is an anomaly. So I urge members to vote, uh, vote green on this bill. The member from Anoka, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Hornstein. Thank you again for this bill. Um, members, have you ever wanted to go back in time? Go back. Um, there was a, an old movie, right, Back to the Future. Have you ever wanted to get in a time machine and go back into time? Well, I sure have. And whether that's to change the past or just take a look at the past and learn from it. So I want you to jump aboard the Minnesota House of Representatives time machine. Let's go all the way back to last week. When we had a bill here that spent a billion dollars, a billion dollars, of taxpayer money for the frontline workers. And I put forward an amendment at that time requiring the legislative auditor to do a full audit of that program because we've learned projects of this size in particular 
things can go sideways. And there was absolutely no sunshine in that bill. $756,000 to a nonprofit that was funded, that was largely started by someone with the AFL-CIO. Nothing could go wrong there. And a billion dollars going out to various people across the state. Maybe some were going to be able to double dip. Maybe some were going to get money somehow that was in their dog's name. We don't know. But I just find it so interesting that the other side of the aisle is all gone ho on this bill for a legislative auditor, the legislative auditor to do an audit. But just last week, they refused to do the same on a, on a project or on a bill that was about half the cost of this one so far. So members, let's, let's be consistent. Let's learn from history. Let's, let's not repeat it. But let's not be hypocritical either. Thank you, Representative Hornstein. I'll be a green vote. The member from Hennepin, Representative Hurtas. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. It's good to uh, be on the floor and speak again, and I am welcome everything without being the mask, and I can actually see your face again. Representative Hornstein, uh, I appreciate uh, what the effort you're doing here with this bill. Uh, you told me about it several weeks ago, and uh, I sent you a message. I did sign on to it because I think it's the right thing to do. But what I can say about this Southwest Light Rail project is wow. I mean, just wow. We're talking overruns. Uh, Representative Nash mentioned a little while ago that history matters. I'd like to take you back in time when I was in my 20s. I had bought a new home in Brooklyn Park. I had some farmland up there. And I also was a business owner on Main Street. And I was a taxpayer, a Hennepin County taxpayer. And I was paying attention. I was pretty concerned because they were talking about getting rid of this metropolitan stadium and building the new Humphrey Dome. And they said it would only cost $38 million. And it seemed like an exorbitant amount of money at that time, which it was. But I told my colleagues, I said, they'll never build it for that. In fact, it cost nearly $60 million, nearly double. It came as no surprise when they started talking about Southwest Light Rail. Initially, when the conversation started, it was under a billion. It was around $950 million. Quickly, that got adjusted to $1.2 billion. A billion. What is a billion? It's often been said that a billion minutes ago was the coming of Christ, that a billion seconds ago was the landing of Columbus. And it's been said that a billion dollars was late yesterday afternoon at the U.S. Treasury, but now I think it's about Southwest Light Rail. It's the last couple of years. Go from 900 million up to 2.75 billion, and it's still not done. The thing that's most amazing to me about this whole process is how does it just keep getting shoved down the rail? People just keep pushing this along. And the legislature said, no, we're not going to do that anymore. They kept coming back for more money. And some of the things they did, just to, to Representative Elkin's point, where we've got so much money in it, you know, like there's no turning back. But that doesn't make sense either because we don't know the operational costs. And as Representative Doubt said, he'll guarantee it'll be more than the $2.75 billion. But it seemed to be such a cozy relationship between the Hennepin County Board, the CTIB, the County Transit Improvement Board. There was one man in common between those two boards that was really had his eyes on shiny objects called a train and then the Met Council. One of the most egregious things they did in the last couple of years, I was on the Transportation Committee with uh, Representative Kosnick and then Representative Runbeck. Uh, we had the, the charge of looking into this Southwest Light Rail. And it was just astounding that without even the rail being in the ground, they already bought the cars. They bought rail cars. We own them. We already have rail cars for a line that doesn't run tens of millions of dollars, and I thought, well, they can run on the other lines, right? No, 
This is a new train. They won't hook up to the, to the other trains that are in existence. So it's just jamming more money into the cost show. We just have to keep feeding this. When I was served on that committee, the rail line that goes up northwest to Brooklyn Park and Dayton, the lobbyists for the rail line came into my office and they said, they're not listening to us. We don't want passenger rail in a freight corridor. We need that space for future expansion of the freight rail. But they still kept plowing forward. Then I was shocked to see that Brooklyn Park went ahead and started vacating land and clearing land for the rail stations before it's even got the green light, or even that the corridor has been established. Who can stand for this kind of stuff? Who's really in charge? I mean, that's what's so astounding, and that's what really gets the taxpayers agitated. You know, members, 97.5% of all ridership is on cars and buses. We're talking about two and a half, and even less now, is ridership on rail. Yet the disproportionate cost of providing this type of modal system is extraordinary. A billion dollars. At a million dollars a lane mile, that's a thousand miles of lane in the metro Twin Cities. How far is it from Wright County to Hudson? Probably about 60 miles. Think about that. How many lanes into a thousand at 60 miles? I've traveled all around this country, frequently in some of the major metropolitan areas, and it seems like we are shortchanged when it comes to lanes for a metropolitan area our size. A couple of years ago, I recall a joint committee with the Senate and the House over in the new Senate building, and it was a transportation hearing, and then President of the Council, Met Council, Adam Dunnick, was before the Senate and the House Transportation Committees. I asked Adam Dunnick at that time, do you think that the Met Council should be getting into the freight rail business. Do you, do you have the authority to do that? And it was just a rather succinct yes. And why were they doing that? Because Kenilworth was the only corridor they could figure out, and then the little light line there didn't want anything to do with having co-location of passenger rail in that tight little corridor. So what did they do? They bought them out. They bought the rail line, and so now Hennepin County owns the rail line. We're in the freight business, too, folks. Leader Doubt mentioned using home building as an example of a contract to go ahead and build a home. And I can assure you in the private sector, if somebody's going to sign on the line and is going to promise to deliver a house in 90 days, they're going to damn well know what the cost is before they sign that purchase agreement, because they made a contract to deliver a product on a certain time. I lived that life for a long time, and you know right down to the nickel what you're going to have in that property. But we have bureaucrats who just think it's okay to use the public's treasure in the piggy bank to have this shiny object that they want to grab and build with no end in sight. So we should be paying attention. I mean, Southwest Light Rail is an example of what's going wrong, and Botno isn't looking any better. And so this audit, Chair Hornstein, is most welcome. It doesn't have the teeth we'd like to see in it, but it is the first step. We need to do that, and we need to learn from these mistakes and maybe throttle back and hold back on some of this expansion of light rail. So with that, members, I urge a green vote today on this uh, piece of legislation. It's the right thing to do, but we have to be paying attention. We thought we got out of the light rail business at the state legislature, but they're going to keep coming back. They're going to keep looking for bailouts. Botano is going to be no different, and we really ought to be responsible and be accountable to the taxpayers of Minnesota. So with that, Chair Hornstein, thank you very much. The member from Anoka 
Representative Heinrich. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I know we've been here for a while. It's been probably a long day already for, for some of us. Um, I'm personally looking forward to eating some food here soon, and I hope to maybe see some other members over at uh, the Kelly or the Radisson here later and share, share a meal and we can continue this conversation because um, it's an important one. Uh, members, uh, Mr. Speaker, my, my fear here, my concern is that we're kind of in a worst case scenario moment where you have um, people spending money that's not their money on a product that they also don't use. I think we saw a couple hands of somebody that, a couple maybe that uses the product, but uh, whenever you're evaluating something's efficiency and benefit and um, you know, whether or not the dollars are being used wisely, uh, generally you get further away from that efficiency when you're using other people's money and you don't even use the product. So you lose quality and you lose efficiency. So that's my fear here that we're, uh, we're kind of going down that, that track. Uh, Mr. Speaker, will uh, Representative Chair Hornstein yield for a question? He will yield, Representative Heinrich. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Hornstein, I, I'm looking through the bill and there's a lot of things I like in here. Evaluate whether Metropolitan Council's posting, interviewing, hiring process for internal staff resulted in qualified and competent project management personnel. That's an important one. We should make sure that the people that were hired um, you know, hopefully they check the box of competency, not, not some kind of equity box. Hopefully that's the issue. If you're going to go in for surgery, you want the doctor to be competent. You know, hopefully it wasn't looked at through a, a lens of, of equity. So I think that would be a good one to audit. But Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm concerned that maybe that's not going to get audited because prior to that and on uh, one, line 1.15, the legislative auditor is only encouraged to. And so my question, Chair Hornstein, is why is, the, why is there permissive language in we're just encouraging these things? I see lots of other ones in here that I like as well. Um, whether or not the vendors and contractors are adhering to establish safety standards, practices, but I guess the auditor doesn't have to, have to do those things. They're just encouraged to. And then, Mr. Chair, there's no reporting actually required that I see in this bill. So I'm going to vote for this today because I think it's good and we need that audit. Uh, but I'm a little concerned about the permissive language. I was wondering if you could give us some insight on, um, on how that works and, and why we're not uh, requiring some of these really important questions uh, about safety, about how people are hired, what the process is, about change orders. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. The member from Hennepin, Representative Hornstein. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the excellent question, Representative Heinrich, and it, it gives me an opportunity to uh, clarify a very, very important point here. Uh, members, what we're doing is unusual because the scale and scope of this issue is a bit unusual, as many have pointed out. So we have to walk a line, a fine line between mandating things that the auditor should examine and making uh, advising and making suggestions because we don't do this often at the legislature. But I took this unusual and relatively unprecedented step because of the magnitude of this issue. I am very confident, Mr. Speaker and Representative Heinrich, that this is sort of an outline, if you will, for topics that we can come together on and identify. Uh, the auditor will look at these, I am confident. Secondly, Representative Heinrich, uh, Mr. Speaker and Representative Heinrich, every one of these audits has recommendations. Every one of these audits actually uh, often will give specific direction to the legislature on how to address these. So we will be getting objective and actionable advice through this audit. And I am very confident that these 17 very specific things that we have brought up will be examined in this report. The member from Minoka, Representative Heinrich. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And will the uh, chair continue to yield? He will yield, Representative Heinrich. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
So, Chair Hornstein, I'm wondering if, if in theory, the auditor chose, uh, because it's permissive, they're encouraged to evaluate whether Met Council's interviewing process, hiring process for internal staff resulted in qualified and competent project management personnel. If they choose to investigate that, and in theory, if they found some information that they didn't like or wasn't politically expedient at the time, would they not have to report that information? Would, would they, are they required to report on any of these, Mr. Chair? Thank you, Mr. Repre Speaker. Representative Hornstein. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Representative Heinrich, I believe the Office of the Legislative Auditor is the gold standard when it comes to producing objective, critical reports. That uh, and, and objective reports that may be critical of agencies and uh, uh, departments within state government. That's what we have charged them to do as legislators. They work for us. They don't work for the agency. They don't work for the private sector or any of the, the uh, entities that they investigate. So they'll come up, I, I'm very confident that they will come up with a strong, objective report. Uh, they will leave no stone unturned in this investigation. And I do not share your concerns about uh, them withholding information or, or being influenced by outside forces. Representative Heinrich. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you for that answer, Representative Hornstein. I, and I agree with you. I, I don't mean to uh, uh, discredit the, the auditor, the office of the auditor. I just think it's important when we're writing, when we're writing a bill to uh, include those things, the old, uh, you know, trust but verify. I, I trust them as well, and I, and I know you do, and I hope for the same things that you do that this comes out in a way that's uh, you know, transparent to everybody and that they didn't leave a stone, any stone unturned, as you, as you say, Mr. Chair. Um, but it, it just, I think when we're, when we're writing bills, we want an audit like this to have teeth because it's so important to Minnesotans. And it's not our money that we're spending. And so since it's not our money, the least we could do is make sure that the language is locked tight and so that everything can be uh, evaluated in a, in a transparent way. So thank you for that answer, uh, uh, Chair Hornstein. I appreciate the time. I'm going to vote green on, on this bill today. I think it's a, it's a good bill. My concern is that I just don't feel like it has enough uh, uh, teeth, I guess you could say. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member from Hennepin, Representative Katisa Watoon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Members, conversation and planning for the Southwest Light Rail project began shortly after I was born. So indeed, history matters. When my husband and I moved to Eden Prairie over a decade ago, plans had started to firm up. As recent college graduates at that time, it was very appealing to know that we would soon have access to Minneapolis via light rail. Now my kids have been watching and waiting for the train for as long as they can remember. Construction is all but complete in Eden Prairie. We are all dressed up, but we have nowhere to go yet. All this to say, I know the delays of this project well. Although today we're simply focused on this audit as a measure of good governance, transparency, and accountability for taxpayer dollars, I would like to briefly address the comments that we've heard today about defunding transit and share my community's support for this project. As Eden Prairie Mayor Ron Case recently noted, the city has already seen substantial commercial and residential development surrounding the four local transit stations that wouldn't have happened without the promise of Southwest Light Rail. Constituents, seniors in particular, have expressed to me a desire to be able to go make the trip to downtown Minneapolis, take in a show, try a new restaurant, or go to a museum without having to worry about driving on the highway or finding a parking space. Local business leaders are wholly supportive of this project. In fact, life is short and memories seem to be shorter because the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce lobbied in DC on behalf of this project. While I do support a full audit of the process, I believe it would be fiscally irresponsible to shut down construction while an audit occurs. Further delays don't serve Eden Prairie residents and will almost certainly lead to increased costs. And should a project that's more than three decades in the making be canceled altogether, costs will balloon beyond what we're already looking at, and my constituents will be subject to unnecessary demolition and reconstruction in the heart of our city. 
The increase in cost and extended completion timeline are concerning and frustrating to me as a resident and taxpayer of Hennepin County and as a legislator. Members, I support House File 3035. A full audit will allow all involved to learn what's happened here and to help prevent future issues. Minnesotans deserve a comprehensive transportation system, and it's essential that we work together to deliver those projects in the most timely and cost-effective manner possible. Vote green, thank you. The member from Wasika, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and first, uh, uh, Chair Hornstein, thank you for carrying this bill. You know, I'm a co-author on it, and I've appreciated working uh, with you on it. Uh, it. Certainly, this bill has given us an opportunity to talk about the, the merits of light rail versus bus, uh, et cetera, and whether or not we should or shouldn't. But that's not the real reason why I think this bill is, is worthy of our support. So the question is, why do we need, need this report? Well, every dollar spent on this project and every dollar that's going to be spent on this project comes from taxpayer dollars. And as the primary responsibility of this body is to be a fiduciary responsible uh, use of those funds, we have to remember that the Met Council who oversees this project, and I think we all agree that there's been some errors and mismanagement there, we have to remember that that is a non-elected appointed uh, commission or board uh, doing that. And so there is really no recourse from the voter uh, to really say, hey, uh, you need to be responsible to us. But here at the legislature, we are responsible to them. And so I think it's very important for us to keep that in, in mind. Um, so the, there's, there's a lot of errors, I think, in, in mismanagement, and we can all point to fingers, and even uh, uh, Chair Gazelli said there were a lot of errors uh, made. But in committee the other day, uh, we had the Met Council really talk about it, uh, the update on, on this project. And just to give you an example of some of the things that have been missteps made, uh, they said they knew when they got approval from the federal government that they needed to put a wall between the railroad and the slight rail down in Minneapolis, but they let the bids before they knew what the engineering of that wall was. Well, hello, that's kind of a red flag, isn't it? Um, when you're asked to do something, you don't even know what the price is. They said also that there was uh, the uh, Eden Prairie Station was not in the original proposal, uh, but all of a sudden it got put in there. Certainly that should be another red flag as to why uh, we should be having an audit and have somebody kind of look over uh, the fiduciary responsibility. But a minority leader Dowd is correct. We could do this audit, but that doesn't mean the mismanagement is going to stop just because we started the audit from what has happened in the past. It's one of the very reasons why I pushed for the amendment to really help us understand what's going to happen from now forward. And so I think that's an important piece that, that we need to, to remember. So uh, the other question, of course, is, is so we get this audit, what are we going to do with this information when we get it next year? That's the challenge, isn't it? And I think uh, uh, Minority Leader Doubt really asked that same question. So what do we do with it? Well, certainly I think the audit and, and what it tells us should be beneficial for all projects into the future. I think it's going to be much far reaching than just this particular project. It will give us some opportunities to really see red flags earlier rather than later so that we can uh, help stop them. Uh, my challenge for this body is next year when we get this audit, we will have an opportunity to come together again to address what needs to be done to put in some sort of stop gaps or warning signals or something so that other projects of this size, smaller size, um, additional botano lines, whatever, uh, might be beneficial for us to have some oversight. The taxpayers are asking and I think expecting us to hold accountable those that have uh, that have been given the responsibility of overseeing the money that they have given to us. And we're the people and the body that needs to do that. So I challenge all of you that um, next year we come together 
and we use this report and pass some additional legislation that actually helps us into the future. So I'm asking for a green vote, and I again thank you, uh, Chair Hornstein, for putting this bill together. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member from Anoka, Representative Barr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Everybody this evening or this afternoon, late afternoon, evening has covered a lot of the points uh, I wanted to make, so I'm not going to belabor them again, but I have two things. I want to borrow the member from Scott, uh, from uh, 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 Anoka, Representative Scott's time machine, and I don't want to go back a week. I want to go back to uh, May of 2017. I have the veto message that then Governor Dayton signed for the transportation bill that it had passed the House and the Senate and it had in there mandates that uh, required duplicative alternative, or uh, you had to have uh, engineering studies for the light rail project or, and uh, submit all of that prior to it starting, and it had a requirement that the Metropolitan Council pay for a vibration susceptibility study for Calhoun Isles and by an engineering firm and the Condo Owner Association, et cetera, et cetera. All these things, if they would have been done, which had passed this chamber and the other body across the hall, we wouldn't be in this mess today. Yes, thank you, Representative Hornstein. You knew that this would be a problem. It's your backyard. So yeah, I am gonna be voting for the uh, bill today, but there's a few other things that should be mentioned along here that we tried, we saw this was a problem and we tried to prevent it ahead of time. And now we're gonna end up paying exorbitant amounts of money. Uh, while it's been said that every light rail line has come in on budget, it depends on how you count whether it came in on budget because original budget numbers for uh, Hiawatha were 400 million and it came in at over 700 million when it's final. But it depends on when you start. If you use the construction date as a start date for your, your stuff or whether the initial estimates on the project before you start planning. And um, uh, Green Line is even worse, which is almost over double. But I did want to, if the uh, author would yield for one question. He will yield, Representative Barr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and uh, Representative Hornstein. Could you tell me what the process is going to be and just some kind of idea what kind of cost the state will be on the hook for? Or if the state or, well, I should say taxpayers, because it doesn't really matter whether the state pays it, the Metropolitan Council pays it, or the county pays it, or city pays it, it's all coming out of taxpayer dollars. But should the, uh, the cracks in the foundation at, is it Kennewith, uh, the, the, where the foundation things, uh, the pillars, where they're building that tunnel now, if that comes back and the building gets condemned, Who's paying the bill, and do you have any idea of all of the ramifications on that? The member from Hennepin, Representative Hornstein. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Representative Barr. And uh, yeah, you, you reminded me that I got vetoed uh, five years ago. Uh, we did a vibration study. It's called the Calhoun Isles uh, Condominiums. Um, no, this project is uh, funded, uh, and again, Representative Nash, uh, because of your legislation. Uh, is funded by the federal government in Hennepin County. So uh, my guess is some combination of those two, but more, more likely Hennepin County would be bearing the costs of any issues there. Representative Barr. Would uh, the author yield for another question, please? He will yield, Representative Barr. Uh, Mr. Speaker and Representative Hornstein, so Hennepin County will probably cut the bill or end up with the bill. So what kind of bill are we looking at? Are we looking at condemning the building, destroying it, pay, buying the owners out, paying for moving costs? I mean, what we all would be involved in this if we end up by if the buildings condemned? Representative Hornstein. Mr. Speaker, Representative Barr, that's speculative. We're not at that place right now. Um, you know, the, there is no construction on the, in the area happening at this time uh, because of the issues that have been identified. Uh, so um, I don't know if anyone has done that study. Uh, there is a cost benefit and a broader cost benefit analysis in this bill, um, but I, I can't speculate on, on those costs other than that um, there, there is a lot of concern in that building. I'm in frequent contact with the residents. Representative Barr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for, to the author for yielding. Um, if we have to buy that out and move those people or we have to move the light rail line to somewhere else. Either way, it's an, a, just a ridiculous amount of money that we got to put on top of this. All of things that could have been prevented, 
if we would have actually gotten the things signed into law, the last little hurdle, which I, I remember, because most many of us were on the chamber at the time, that was a very partisan veto. Um, you know, I, I realize that this is, this is a body made up of politicians and politics is done all the time, it's played all the time, but every once in a while we do swerve in to right is, you know, goes across the aisle and this is something that should have been done to prevent absorbent waste of taxpayer dollars because it really doesn't matter whether it comes out of Hennepin County's pocket or the federal government's pocket, it's coming out of a taxpayer pocket and it's just a matter of which, which which pocket we're going to pick at the time when it comes around. So, yes, I will be voting for this. Uh, one, one last point. Uh, let's, and this has kind of been hit on a couple of times. Would uh, Representative West yield for a question? Representative West will yield to a question. He will yield, Representative Barr. Mr. Speaker and Representative West, could you tell the body how many times do you believe that uh, the study for fixing Route 65 or adjusting traffic on Route 65, is, Highway 65, through your uh, city has been done before? The member from Anoka, Representative West. Since 2009, three times that I'm aware of. And we're finally getting work done now. Representative Barr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So it's three studies and we're doing another one now, or three studies have been completed and we're starting construction now? Representative Barr, are you asking Representative West if he'll yield Sorry, for another Mr. question? Sorry, Mr. Speaker, will he yield for another question? He to clarify. will yield, Representative West. The third one counts the one uh, we passed into law in 2017. Representative Barr. Thank you for the clarification, Representative West. So. I'm hoping that this is not another one of those, we have to have three studies of we got problems before we actually put a shovel in the ground and engineer a so solution to the problem. But uh, with that being said, I, I, and I think everybody in the chamber is probably gonna be voting yes on this today, so thank you. The member from Hennepin, Representative Joachim. A little out of practice, Mr. Speaker, thank you. Um, I rise to support House File 3035 and audited the extension of the green line known as Southwest LRT. What we can learn from this audit will help us learn where we've been, what needs to improve, and how we can find efficiencies as we build future projects. And I appreciate our colleagues of both sides of the aisle who've kept their comments focused on the importance of an audit. Southwest Light Rail is an integral part of the build out of a multimodal transit system that includes LRT, BRT, arterial lines, and bus services. Fixed lines like LRT and BRT increase economic development and enhance the communities that they travel through. And just a reminder, the North Star, that's a heavy rail line. LRT and BRT are subsidized to the tune of under $1.60 a ride. That is data-driven, not back-of-the-napkin math. The 14.5-mile route has already seen $2 billion of investment and development along the line, which not, would have not happened without Southwest LRT. This project has also brought many jobs in the metro area and beyond. 65 out of our 87 counties have folks that are bringing home paychecks because of the construction along this line. I am not ashamed of the work our women and men in the construction trades have done on this project. The Southwest Metro is the largest growing job sector in the metro area. That is why our regional chambers have supported this project and why many employers and employees in our communities are counting on it. While I support this audit, it is important to note that construction must continue as audits being done. Stalling construction would only cost more money. And for those of you calling for stopping the project altogether, that would be fiscally irresponsible. This project is 65% constructed. We've received money from the federal government we would have to pay back, money that wouldn't have even come in our state without this project. The full funding grant agreement would require us to put back the areas along the line to their original status. That would mean tearing down bridges, retaining walls, grade separating tunnels, pulling down constructed stations and track that's already been laid. That would not only cost more money, but there would be no funding stream to do this. And it could lay the state open to lawsuits for broken contracts. Members, 
the audit is a very prudent thing to do. And trust me, I'm as frustrated with the delays and increased costs as anybody since I've been working and talking about this project for 16 years. My constituents are disappointed too. But there is also still strong support from our communities and those of us whose taxes are paying for this line. Finally, I would offer to host any of you to come to the communities of Hopkins and St. Louis Park to see what this project has meant to our community. Thank you for your attention, members. Vote yes on the audit. The member from Olmsted, Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the uh, Representative Hornstein yield for a series of questions? He will yield. Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Hornstein, what are the last two targets for budget targets for the Transportation Committee? The member from Hennepin, Representative Hornstein. Um, Mr. Speaker, Representative Quam, are you talking about the final target for the conference committee? Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we can take what the uh, Transportation Committee budget and spending for the last two uh, budgets were. Uh, Representative our, Hornstein. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Quam, our general fund target for the conference committee last year was $220 million. Representative Quam. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, another question. What was the portionality of the spending for the Transportation Committee for Roads and Bridges? Representative Hornstein. Representative Hornstein, we can't hear you. Sorry, I think we have a technical issue. Thank you, Representative Lilly. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Representative Quam. If you look at all the different funding sources, you know, trunk highway bonds, uh, the, the whole gamut, I think it really comes out to about 85% of the budget for roads, about 15% for transit, active transportation, other items, roads and bridges. Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, Chair Hornstein, my understanding is that the last two budgets were in the order of less than a quarter billion dollars. Uh, just the overrides on this project have been the equivalent of, you know, almost a decade of budgets or around a decade of budgets. And it'd be nice if we had an automatic um, fiduciary trigger that basically said, uh, you know, if we're off by 100% or 200%, we need to really look at see and see what was wrong with the process because that's not doing the right and good thing for the people of the state of Minnesota. This audit hopefully will tell us what was done incorrectly so we don't repeat stupid things. Because it is not appropriate for us to say we're going to spend X on this and then have it be 2X or 3X. And until this is completed, we won't know what the end cost will be. And the magnitude is equivalent to several budgets of the Transportation Committee. I know there are other sources, federal, etc. But I wanted the people at home to realize the magnitude of this cost override and why um, it should almost be automatic when we do a process that is so far off that it's a decade worth of transportation targets for our budgets. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member from Douglas, Representative Franzen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, it's a joy to be able to speak again in the House chamber, and I miss it so much. I have so much to say, but I did promise my colleagues I would keep it short. 
<laughs> um, members, uh, House Republicans here today had several amendments that would freeze spending, scrap the project altogether, and require greater transparency, transparency in the financial side of the project. So while we are talking about the audit of light rail, and um, many of our amendments were not adopted, even with that, I will I will support I will support this audit. Um, but I just want to remind the body: we heard about how costly the light rail is, and how much of a boondoggle and a waste of tax dollars it is, and will continue to be because this project is continuing to be funded even under this audit. Today, this morning in Alexandria, gas was $3.49 a gallon. This evening, it jumped up to $3.64. Okay, Minnesotans and people all over this state, all over this nation are struggling with high costs of energy. Coming from the um, uh, this is from the Joint Economic Committee um, in the Senate there. Uh, there was an analysis done to combat rising energy prices, we must unleash American production. So this took from measured from December of 2019 before the pandemic disrupted global markets. Energy prices are now 20% higher. Due to these high energy prices, researchers with the Penn Wharton budget model estimate that the average American household spent 1,200 more on energy costs alone in 2021 compared to the previous year. It is now 2022, and we know that is also going to increase from that annual $1,200. Members, this is what I'm concerned with, is our family budgets, Minnesotans cannot continue to waste their tax dollars on light rail when they are trying to figure out how they're going to put gas in their car so they can go to work to put food on the table. So while, we're, while, we, while we continue this session discussing light rail and the pros and the cons of it, I also want to remember that there are taxpayers, our constituents, that are asking themselves, why are we wasting all kinds of money on light rail when it's harder for them to pay their heating bill, put gas in their, in their vehicle. And eventually I can see this body coming together to put more money into the heating assistance program so that they can pay their overdue and late heating bills. Members, we have got to start looking at the big picture here. And while it may not be popular in your mind to end the light rail subsidies and building of that. We also have to look at what's best for our constituents and what's best for their wallets. Thank you. The member from Hennepin, the author of the bill, Representative Hornstein. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members, for a good debate. Um, I just wanted to uh, reiterate in conclusion how important and precedent setting this audit is. And I want to respond, I think there were some very constructive comments from the other side of the aisle. I especially appreciated Representative Petersburg's comments, Representative Nash's comments. But there were others that were a bit uh, cynical about the legislative auditor and comments that this has no teeth. Members, we are directing the legislative auditor to do 17 separate critical items. And as I said, the auditor is the gold standard. It is objective. It is nonpartisan. We haven't had this kind of information about this project or a project of this magnitude. I have faith in the legislative auditor. The legislative auditor is the appropriate place for a study like this. And again, we are stepping out of the box a bit, doing this by legislation. There were a few cynical comments about how much time will pass. In order for the legislative auditor to do a good and credible job and investigation of this magnitude, we need to give them the space to do it. And members, we're going to have actionable information within just a few months. 
when this special review is completed. And members, as in any legislative audit, whether it is the special review or whether it's a program evaluation, there will be specific actionable items for the legislature, not just for future large projects, but this one. It will ensure transparency. It will ensure accountability. It will give us a path forward. And I look forward to those results. Members, we can come together on good government, on accountability. That is the core of this bill. I ask for your support. I ask for your green vote. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The clerk will take the ro roll on the bill. Members, please vote. <laughs> Members voting remotely, please vote. Will the Chief Clerk please call the names of the members who have not yet voted? Backer. Backer, aye. Backer, aye. Bonner. Bonner, aye. Banner, aye. <coughs> Christensen. Christensen, aye. Christensen, aye. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, aye. Grunhagen, aye. Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Hamilton, aye. Houseman. Houseman, aye. Houseman I. Hollins. Hollins I. Hollins I. Mariani. Mariani I. Mariani I. Mason. Mason I. Mason I. McDonald. McDonald I. McDonald I. Munson. Munson I. Munson I. Nelson N. Nelson N. I. Nelson N. I. Sandell. Sandell, aye. Sandell, aye. Sandstead. Sandstead, aye. Sandstead, aye. Thompson. <clears throat> Thompson. Zhang T. Zhang T, aye. Zhang T, aye. Thompson. Thompson. The clerk will close the roll. There being 129 ayes and one nay, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. Motions and resolutions. There's copies of the non-controversial motions at the House desk and online. If there's no objection, we will take action on these motions first. Hearing no objection, the motions prevail. <clears throat> Nash moves that House Hall number 3805 be recalled from the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform, Finance, and Policy and be re-referred to the Committee on State Government, Finance, and Elections. The member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have spoken to both chairs and we are going to re-refer uh, this bill, 3805, to um, State Government Finance, this is a bill that Representative Winkler and I are both authors on that would remove the sunset on the Capital Area Security Commission. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. Announcements. 
The member from Monoman. Monoman, yes. Representative Green. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would ask for a moment of silence tonight for the former tribal representative for the White Earth Nation, Kathy Goodwin. Uh, over the years, Kathy worked for the people of White Earth in various capacities. She began in conservation court, and through there she established the White Earth Motor Vehicle Department exercising regulatory authority over motor vehicles and even designed the White Earth uh, license plate in the 1990s. She also worked in the tribal court before her service of elected uh, office came in 2014. Kathy passionately served the people of White Earth Nation as District 2 representative from 2014 to 2021. And then she took a step back uh, that year to focus on her own health. Kathy was always about the people. She was a caring individual who was ready to lend a hand when and wherever needed. She was the voice of many, often speaking her mind, but always determined to get things done. Kathy can be credited for many positive things being accomplished on the reservation and especially Natawash. She was on numerous boards and chaired many activities, too many to list. When Kathy wasn't volunteering, she enjoyed cooking, baking, gardening, sewing, and she liked classic movies, but mostly she loved spending time with her family. She will be greatly missed by everyone who was lucky enough to know her. Services for Kathy will be at seven, or excuse me, will be at 11 o'clock on Friday, this Friday, at uh, the NATO Wash Sports Complex. So if I could get a moment of silence for Kathy Goodwin. Members, please rise for a moment of silence. Announcements? Lots of people standing, but probably nobody who wants to make an announcement. <laughs> Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, I move that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 3.30 p.m. Monday, March 7th, 2022. Representative Winkler moves that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 3.30 p.m. Monday, March 7th. All those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, I move that the House do now adjourn. Representative Winkler moves that the House do now adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The House stands adjourned until 3.30 p.m. Monday, March 7th, 2022.